like to call this meeting to order. Can I read this first? A little louder. I'd like to call this meeting to order. It's 630. In accordance with an act to implement provisions necessary to the health, welfare, and safety of the citizens of Maine in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency, as enacted to read section G-11 MRSA 403, a public a public proceedings through remote access during declaration of state of emergency due to COVID-19. This workshop is live at one city hall plaza in the city hall council chambers with only the school board superintendent and allowable mem member of the ESD staff participants allowed according to the governor's executive order present. This meeting will be broadcast live on the Ellsworth High School Facebook page and the YouTube page, which will be shared to the City of Ellsworth YouTube channel. The meeting is also broadcast live on Spectrum Channel 1303. May I ask you all to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Marcosian, what I recommend that you take a roll call of the board members present. All right. I'll start to my right. Rob Hudson, present. Jennifer Alexander, present. Abigail Miller, present. And I'm Paul Marcosian, present. And I would like to announce uh, this evening uh, some sad news. Uh, Brenda Thomas, our board chair, will not be with us this evening. Uh, her mother passed away, and she is with her family right now. Uh, we pass on our uh, sympathies and condolences to the family, and let Brenda and her family know that our thoughts and prayers are with her. Thank you, Dan, for that message. Um, let me just get the agenda in front of me. I think the first item on the agenda is the approving the minutes from the last meeting. Um, is that right? Adjustments. Adjustments. Adjustment to the agenda, sorry. <coughs> there are no adjustments to propose for the agenda, but I will let board members know that when we get to new business, the uh, first two items, item one, acknowledgement of personnel committee's action on behalf of the board, and item two, consideration of teacher nomination, we will not have any candidates whose names we're going to bring forward this evening. Um, so when we get to those two items, we will just uh, move on to them and go to item three. Other than that, there are no uh, adjustments, and there does not need to be action taken to uh, take those off the agenda. All right. Approval of minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes of August 11th, 2020, board meeting as presented. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Communications and correspondence. I do have three letters of resignation that I will take up under my report. Okay. Public participation. Um, school board meetings are conducted for the purpose of carrying out the official business of the school system. All regular, special, and emergency meetings of the board are open to the public. The public is cordially invited to attend and participate in board meetings as provided in this policy. Although board meetings are not public forums, the board will provide appropriate opportunities for citizens to express opinions and concerns related to the matters under consideration by the board. The intent is to allow fair and adequate opportunity for the public to be heard and to provide adequate time for the board to obtain information and opinion on subjects before it, while ensuring that the time allowed for public discussion does not interfere with the fulfillment of the scheduled agenda. Um, ordinary, ordinarily, we would um, there would be time allotted for members of the public to come to the podium and speak, but we're doing this different way. So for members of the public who wish to address the board within the guidelines provided in this policy, we're asking that you please uh, send an email to myself, the vice chair of the board, and my email address <coughs> is pmarkosian, M-A-R-K-O-S as in Sam, I-A-N as in Nancy, at ellsworthschools.org. Um, the chair may limit the time allotted for comments, and uh, citizens and employees of the school unit are welcome to participate as provided in this policy. Others may be recognized to speak at the chair's dis discretion. Individual employees and or employee groups will not be permitted to discuss matters for which complaint or grievance procedures are provided. 
during the time set aside for public participation, the chair will, rep will be responsible for recognizing all speakers who must identify themselves as they begin speaking. So purposes of tonight, please, if you send a message, um, identify yourself in the email. And speakers are not allowed, not permitted to share gossip, make defamatory comments, or use abusive or vulgar language. All speakers are to address the chair and direct questions or comments to particular board members or the superintendent only with the approval of the chair. Requests for information or concerns that require further research may be referred to the superintendent. Members of the school board and the superintendent may ask questions of any person who addresses the board but are expected to refrain from arguing or debating issues. No complaints or allegations will be allowed at school board meetings concerning any person employed by the school department or against particular students. Personal matters or complaints concerning student or staff issues will not be considered in a public meeting, but will, re, will, but will be referred through established policies and procedures. In order to make efficient use of meeting time, the board discourages duplication or repetition of comments to the board. The board requests that groups or organizations be represented by designated spokespersons. The chair has the authority to stop any presentation that violates these guidelines for the privacy rights of others. So I didn't read the entire policy on our public participation, but that's most of it. So with that, I will check my email where I don't see uh, anything that's come in, but we can revisit this later. Mm -hmm. All right. Administrative board reports. Mr. Clifford, are you up first? Yeah. Good evening. So we finished our first week of um, school with students, which was great to see them. It's been about five months since we've had students walk in the hallways and in the classrooms, and it was a really welcoming sight. Uh, so first is going over our enrollment as of today. So we have 130 freshmen, 127 sophomores, 134 juniors, and 117 seniors. And that does include our bridge students from other schools uh, for 508 students. So it's up about 25 to 30 kids from, from last year, which is good. Uh, today what we did, we wanted some feedback from the students um, to see how things are going for them. Um, and we had a 20 minute advisory period. And so the, all the teachers did an activity with their advisors. And it was really what's going really well and uh, what are some challenges that you're facing. And so I went through and um, I'm not gonna go through all the responses, but I did the top five that were the most common. And so for things that are going well, so feedback from students is smaller classes, so there's more attention from uh, teachers and they're really conferencing with us. Everyone has cooperated with wearing masks. Teachers using only Google Classroom and Zoom to communicate. High percentage of students are adhering to the social distancing guidelines less distractions and less noise in class. And then some challenges, some challenges that they shared. Uh, sometimes hard to remember social distancing when we see friends. Feel isolated sometimes. It's hot wearing a mask, maybe we need longer mask breaks. Lunch at desk is sometimes hard because you can't socialize with friends. And getting onto Zoom from home isn't 100% yet. So that's a little bit of feedback from students so far. We'll do this periodically um, after a couple weeks go by just so we can help them. Um, today, after school, we did the same thing with the teachers um, through a Google Doc and uh, that was shared with everybody. And um, so it's, it was a good week. It was, um, you know, you, you, it's anticipating, you're kind of anticipating what's gonna happen. Um, but I think overall people felt good about it and. Uh, the amount of kids that are in the school are probably just right right now. You know, it's about half the population or a little less, and, and that seems perfect, you know, for, for now. So, no, I was really happy with the week. Excellent. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment, <clears throat> and I have to commend you and thank you for surveying the students and staff. Because I think that input right now is going to be crucial. So. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And some, uh, you know, one last piece of information, because we got our, our um, laptops out mm -hmm. uh, to about 90% of our students have it. The ones that don't have them, 
that's because they were damaged and they had to send them away. And so our IT staff did a terrific job. Last Tuesday, all the freshmen got theirs. And then we took two, uh, then Wednesday, all the Maroon group got theirs. And Thursday, yesterday, all the gray group got theirs. So I really want to thank the IT department. They worked really hard. Um, as you know, we were missing over 200 laptops during the summer mm -hmm. that were not returned. And that's why we couldn't get the laptops out during the summer before school started. Um, but it was the next best thing. You know, within three days, everybody had their laptops. So they did a terrific job doing that. So everybody does have, all the kids do have their laptops. All the kids, except no. if they had damage, okay. they had to send them in for repairs and they haven't come back yet. Okay. Yep. And, and that's all the students at the high school that currently At the high right? school, okay. yes. And we'll hear from the other principals on the other schools. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Gabianelli. Good evening. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, much like Mr. Clifford, the long anticipated first day of school has finally arrived. Uh, I greeted students with my new jammy pack, which is a, a fanny pack with Bluetooth speakers, so that we could play music as we <laughs> greeted all of the students coming in. It was fantastic. Some of your students might also have said that I walked through the hallways with it and danced a little bit. I mean, it's okay. We had fun. Um, the first two days went really well. I was super, super proud of our students and our staff for the diligence with the masks and the spacing. The spacing is extremely hard for, much like the high school students, for the middle school students. Um, they just are all over the place and they like to touch. So they have had a little bit um, of a challenge keeping their spacing. Um, but they are doing really well to try to remember. So the, overall, the first week was really, really positive. Some challenges that we ran into um, were much like the high school, the technology piece. Um, seventh and eighth graders currently now have their laptops. They got them yesterday. Fifth and sixth graders will have their laptops next week. Um, and just to remind folks, it's a little bit different. This is normally when the middle school kids get their technology. is typically the second week of school. Um, but I know because we're in a different situation, people were really hoping we would have it before then. But because of the challenge, getting them back and returned and turning that around, um, we did have some devices that came back on the first day um, as students came back too. So that was fantastic. And we were able to, to get those turned around. And IT has worked really hard to... Um, get the laptops ready so that they can be in the hands of students. So by next week, the entire middle school will have um, their devices in hand. Um, we just didn't want to have fifth and sixth graders take them home without cases um, because that would be probably detrimental to the devices if you're cramming them in a backpack. Um, another challenge that we had a little bit was um, the first couple of days we had a challenge with the dismissal, with the, the multiple bus runs and trying to figure that all out. Um, it turns out that we don't need two bus runs right now. Um, we were able to fit everyone on in the afternoon with just one run, and I believe in the morning as well. So that has worked out really well, and um, as we've moved through the week, we've gotten much more efficient with how we get kids on the bus in a timely manner. So though we're still working on that a little bit, um, by today we had gotten it down to about 17 minutes getting all of our students wow. onto the bus. So um, not bad at all. We'll keep, we'll keep it, <coughs> keep working on it, but um, trying to get students loaded and off and on their way um, is critical. Um, the other thing that I think we had a little bit of a challenge with is um, engaging some remote learners this week. Uh, teachers are still navigating how to teach in person and teach remotely simultaneously. Um, so there was a little bit of blip there, but I want to thank all of the families for their patience and kindness and compassion and understanding during this time. Again, something that we've never done before, but we're working really hard to plan and get better as we go along. So we are working on that. Um, but overall, it was really, really a positive week, and we're looking forward to next week. The kids came in, smiles under their masks, um, a little bit apprehensive at first, but once they settled in, they were... Rocking and rolling. So I'm so happy to see all of them, and I can't wait for next week. Any questions? So, you have a question? my, so my daughter went back to middle school this week, and yes. it's the happiest she has been since we have been quarantined. I have to say, she is. She was thrilled, and she thought it went completely smooth. She mm -hmm. absolutely loved it. Um, we. Um, 
we do have some concerns about the workload on in middle school teachers because I know the elementary school teachers, they have individual teachers for the remote only mm -hmm. students, but our middle school teachers, it seems like they're doing double duty. Um, is there any possibility we can talk about as a district of maybe getting them some help? Getting an, somebody, maybe two ed techs per grade dedicated to just maybe doing all the emailing work for the teachers, maybe grading for those teachers, because it is, right now, they are pulling double duty. And I know that they're, you know, got to be exhausted from doing this. They are, and it's a lot of work. We're, right now, um, we met this afternoon, and so um, we're trying to look to see if there's a way that maybe we can shuffle some kids around so that we can group them. Um, in a way that would be a little bit more conducive to help with that. So that's my project for this weekend, um, trying to look at that and then potentially contacting parents. But those are things that we're still looking at. So I will say, and um, this is what I've said to teachers as well, the numbers changed for us drastically in the last two weeks before school. Right. So <laughs> we started, I think, when we started this process of splitting kids into cohorts, there may have been, I'm just going to say, in eighth grade, there were only three fully remote learners at the time. Now we have nine, and it, it happened in every grade level, um, and things changed, and we honored, or we tried to honor almost every single request that we got in terms of color and things like that. So the way the numbers shook out was a challenge, and it was kind of like a domino effect. So now that we've been through a week, we're seeing how this is going, I'm going back and taking a look and seeing how we can rearrange maybe homerooms or things like that to make it a little bit um, easier for teachers. I'm just worried about the support, that are, are these teachers getting the support? Can the school board be doing anything more to support them? And it, you know, is maybe a, more extra staff a solution? That's, you know. I mean, we do have some subs that are in the building that have been helping out this week that we've trained so that in, in, in an event that a teacher needs to be out for a day uh, for an appointment or something like that, the subs are already trained on the protocols and procedures. They've been helping out. Um, in terms of class size, I mean, they have small classes. We're talking no more than 11 kids in a class at a time. It's just trying to figure out how to do that remote piece as well. And we don't have that technology set up yet, but that's on its way. I think in answer to your question, Abby, that uh, if we come to the board and say we're looking to do this and look for different staff, is to look for support for that. Uh, and again, I think as Ms. Gavinelli is saying, you know, it's, it's a calibration time, you know, it's excitement of the first week of school, but with it being no, even with all the preparation and planning and the PD our staff has been through, uh, it's still a learning process for them. So I, I think the fact that you brought up that concern, it's something that you, you've already addressed with the teachers. I think Working it's something on it. that we work on and you know, we may come back to you and say, we need to do this, can you support us with it? So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. More or less. Okay. Yeah. I know we had talked at one, one of the last meetings is the option for a remote teacher not possible for middle school? So in each grade, I know in the elementary side, numbers worked out and that. Right, so we don't have as many not? fully remote learners in the middle mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And so what we're taking a look at, because the numbers have changed, is is that now a possibility? Mm -hmm. um, and and then when we first started this process and started to plan, we did not have this, even after calling parents on the survey, like we called every parent. And we did not have the same numbers as the elementary. And it looked like teachers, if they were going to be remote, were going to need to teach across grade level and across content. Mm -hmm. And they really weren't interested in, in that at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Now numbers have changed a little bit. We go back, we kind of reevaluate after the first week, and we say, OK, what can we do differently? Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we <clears throat> help manage that? OK. Yeah, so we are working on it, seeing what we can do. It's a little bit difficult. We've had some new registrations. The numbers in seventh grade especially are pretty tight. I've got 23 and 24 kids per homeroom with a four teacher. So um, that doesn't mean that there's 24 split. It right. just means that as the homerooms are split, they have some fully remote learners, but the numbers aren't as malleable as in other grade levels. So we're just taking a look at all of it and trying to work with teachers and students and families. How much did the enrollment change? Um, so seventh grade, we, we registered three new kids this week, mm -hmm. just seventh grade. So, um, as an entire school, I don't have my enrollment numbers with That's me, okay. but okay. we've probably registered off the top of my head, 10 new kids total, um, in probably the last three weeks. Yeah. 
changes and things when you're already on a fine balance. Yeah. 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 Right. Big and time. and again, like I said, we tried to honor requests for families. So, mm -hmm. like, some families really need a gray day. Some families really need a maroon day. And so that's kind of what we're working with. So I just have to take a look now that we've been through a week mm -hmm. and see what we can do. Appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> so I was there that morning, the first morning of school with the elementary school just to watch. And... Um, it, it looked like you had had time to practice it several times over. It went, in, from what I saw, it went very well. Um, teachers out front, you out front. Um, there were folks meeting the buses as they pulled in. Um, it, it looked fantastic. Thank and you. The, the other part of it was the reaction from the kids. Um, they were following the distancing regulations without being told. They all had their masks on without being told. Um, and they all looked very comfortable to be there. They looked excited to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, for me personally, it was probably uh, one of the best days since COVID happened, um, watching that return, and it, it went very well. Thank you. Hats off to you and your staff. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah, the, pr the planning and preparation has definitely paid off. It's been a lot of work, but um, it's worth it when you see those kids coming through, so I appreciate that. It showed. It Thank showed you. that morning. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Any other questions? Great. Thank Thanks you so very much. much. <clears throat> Mrs. Clifford? Uh, good evening, everyone. So I wanted to take a minute and just talk about how we approached um, mask wearing and social distancing with our K-4 students. Um, when we talked as a staff, one of the things that we really wanted to focus was a kind of a three-tier approach. The first thing we talked about was loving them, having them back in the building. It had been a long time. They're going to want to see us. They're going to want to uh, want to be near us. And we talked about we wanted to make sure that they felt loved and wanted and appreciated and just glad to have them back. The second part of that is where we're still at is teaching teaching them how to wear their masks, how to take it off properly, how to wash their hands, how to social distance, you know, how to be in their learning zones. And that's really what we're doing. I'm going to be honest, I was so proud of how our students did. The mask wearing, I thought we'd have a lot more difficulty with. We, we really didn't. Kids were, te parents did a great job of prepping their students before they sent them. Teachers done a great job of recognizing when students need individual breaks as well as group breaks. And they've been outside. Um, a lot of our teachers are doing their read alouds outside with their students sitting on uh, spots or under the elm tree or in one of the new tents that we have for outdoor classrooms. So that's just started. So they really thought fully planned on how to do this. So we're really still teaching kids how to be safe right now. And then our staff is modeling. We're modeling with our mask use. We're modeling when we wash our hands. We're modeling when we redirect. We're modeling social distancing. So that's the three-tiered approach we took with our younger students. And I really have felt that it's been a positive experience for everyone that's been in school. In addition, uh, we're still teaching. So we've had two days with one group and one day with another. Is it two and two or one? I'm getting confused now. Two and two. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> two and two. So, you know, you have to think about it. Even though it's been a whole week for us, it's only been two days for them. And we have some work to do. We have some work. We're really working on arrival. Today was a lot better than I thought that it had been for social microphone. distancing. You can press star six to unmute. Um, uh, we're working on recess. Recess has been challenging. I do want to thank Mr. Norwood. He put up some laminated physical activity challenges that students could do on the fence posts. And we have some students going around with duty teachers and, and working on those. Um, so but that, those are works in progress. And we're teaching and modeling and t discussing as a staff and putting it additional dots on the playground equipment, making sure that we have spaces marked for kids and redirecting them to help them with that. So we're, we're teaching still. So I just wanna make sure that people understand that that's the approach that we've taken. We really feel that our students are rock stars and they've done an amazing job. And I really wanna thank the teachers for their out of the box ideas. Someone comes in every day with, hey, what about this? Or can we try this? And so 
the approach has just been about problem solving, about how can we make this better for our kids? Can we do this outside? What about this? Or have we thought of that? I mean, it's just been amazing. And I just love that collaboration um, with our teachers, and it's been a great piece. Um, I do want to give a shout out to our maintenance staff and our custodial staff, our transportation and food service. It has really gone without a hitch. We had a hiccup the first day for a pickup with buses. It just took a long time. And, you know, parents were great. They were patient. They were kind. They were worried, you know, but they called and we knew exactly where kids were and we let them know about that. But, you know, I really want to thank everyone all the time they put in. It, it has been a triumphant year to get the facility ready to go. And um, my students are slated next for devices after um, your students next week. So I would think probably, um, I would probably say ours will probably be into the next week um, for that, which is still fine with us because we're still getting used to our policies and procedures and protocols um, with regard to that. So I think it's been an amazing start and I'm really proud of our teachers and our support staff and our students. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> so with have... those devices coming out, like say the third week, beginning. I of would the third say week. the third week. It's not unusual the way that the rollouts happened. It's mm -hmm. kind of, it's kind of what I used to do. You start with a high school, and then you just mm -hmm. you work your way downward. Um, the younger kids need more time to establish their classroom rules and their protocols and get used to routines before uh, they're they'll be using the NWEA test and the assessments mm -hmm. that come from there. So they're still getting processed. We're not doing any type of that. We're building classroom culture right now and testing, so it's not unusual, but we're slated to get them towards the end. And so those remote learners for those The remote age, learners all have their devices. Have we have three that have not been picked up, okay. but their all parent contacts have been made with remote learners. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Do those devices need delivery? Because we could, I, I could help arrange that um we've talked to them they're 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 um they're ready for a pickup they just weren't able to come to the pickup day that we had had and you know they're kind of just getting in the in the mode of school so yeah they're they're all been have been spoken for and ready to go where what i'm working on now is for next week the goal is to just make contact with everyone we haven't heard from yeah. anyone that hasn't come to school the first two days or they haven't logged into a remote session and I don't have anybody in remote sessions as of today, but we still have, I have four students I'm trying to contact. And how are your numbers too? Did you I did not do my enrollment numbers for this I evening. Not I apologize. The enrollment, but did you receive a lot of registrations too? Yes. 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 <laughs> I figured. Yes. I was just curious. Um, yeah. The new online registration is working well though because it's nice to get a little bit of a heads up once, because you get notified once the application starts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really good with regard to that. So we know they're coming you and we're able unmuted. to see where we can place them. But we really have to... Um, yeah, it's thoughtful planning now because you can't just, um, you know, you can't just take a home room. You have to balance your gray and your, I mean, it's, it's all, and you have siblings and mm -hmm. it's thoughtful planning. It takes a while to get a kid placed. Mm -hmm. But no, we were, I wouldn't say we were overrun, but it's, it was pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, April. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Bowles. Good evening. Uh, HCTC opened on Wednesday, uh, seemingly without a hitch. <laughs> um, the first day went extremely, extremely well. Students, as the other principals have said, it's amazing how they just fall in line, mainly because I think they're so incredibly happy to be back. Um, I think they are following rules to a T because they so desperately want to stay in school, um, which is fabulous to see. Um, our enrollment, we're at 216. Uh, we had several ads this week. Um, so even though we had several drops, the ads kind of offset things. So we've stayed right at 216, which I've been thrilled with. Um, we also talked to staff this afternoon. I asked for their feedback by Monday. But in staff conversations, some of the things that have gone really well is students doing what they're being asked to do. They're being great getting off buses and trying to stay social distance. Every once in a while, they do the conversation drift where they start walking diagonally towards the person <laughs> they're talking to. Um, and then they're like, oh, and then they drift back. <laughs> um, but I think that's very normal for teenagers excited to see their friends, especially 
kids they bonded with last year from Bucksport or MDI. They're excited to see each other. Um, so kids are really doing what they're being asked to do. I am, have been amazed as a staff, kids are logging on remotely. Uh, when you go through classrooms, I have been amazed at engagement in the room and then I look on the teacher's screen and all their faces are there. Um, so kids even from across the county have been zooming into classes. We've worked really hard, teachers have worked extremely hard to be synchronous completely. And so they are instructing and doing new instruction every day. And kids are worried that if they don't zoom in, they're gonna miss. Um, so they are zooming in. We've been thrilled with that participation, which we worried about. I won't lie, we were extremely worried about that. <clears throat> that has been excellent. Um, some of the challenges we're facing is definitely six different high school schedules. That's been extremely complicated this year. Um, Kids are coming and going at different times. Um, every once in a while, it's kind of a logistical nightmare. Today was hard. Friday was hard. The early release and every high school doing something a little bit different on Friday, that was extremely challenging with buses. Um, we had one bus from a district show up 35 minutes after it was supposed to. Um, so just things like that, but it was the first Friday and it was different. So we'll work those kinks out spent a lot of time talking to high school principals today. So <laughs> I know that they're on it and that'll get fixed for next week. Um, and the other big concern at HCTC is staff is really starting to worry about meeting minutes for live work and how that's gonna work. With kids only being in school two days a week, worrying about long-term, what is this gonna mean when certification entities are not changing their hour requirements? So how are we gonna do that? So they're already worrying about that and starting to think about what that might look like long-term. Um, so we're gonna really have to start spending some planning time as a staff talking about that and thinking about how we can meet those needs because kids come to us to get certified. Um, and if we can't offer that, that's gonna be an issue. So we're really gonna have to start thinking about as we get through these next few weeks, Come October 1st, we're gonna to have to start really having some plans in place for what that's gonna look like for each program. Um, so those are really our only two challenges. We were thrilled, IT showed up Wednesday afternoon with all of our bridge devices and all of our biomedical devices. Our biomedical students get specific laptops with specific software to do their scientific research. Those were all up and running and all passed out today. So they have all had them Thursday and Friday. They were passed out. So that was wonderful. So we appreciate all the work they've done. They have to create Ellsworth emails for all of our sending high school kids so they can ask, access Google Classroom. That was done within the first 48 hours. Um, they've busted their tail for us to make sure kids could access their classes over Zoom. So we're incredibly appreciative of that. And like um, other principals said, the custodial staff Brendan and Vicki at my school have worked their tails off. Um, we have one custodian during the day and one on an afternoon shift and they've done anything and everything we've asked them to do during the day to make sure that kids and staff feel safe. And of course the teachers and my staff um, have done an outstanding job with planning and preparing and so excited to have the kids back. Any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for your outstanding ability to manage this schedule because <laughs> all, all of this has been difficult, but your particular puzzle of the multiple schools, the multiple schedules has been one of the hardest. And a lot of people don't understand how much yeah. effort went into making that work, but thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question yeah. real quick. Is Other CTE schools, Amy, in the state, are a lot of them also hybrid? There are two to four that are hybrid. Mm -hmm. Most are actually gone back five days a week mm -hmm. with their high schools going hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on a listserv and one of the questions that I've asked is, how does that affect the sending high school? Mm -hmm. So if you're going five days a week and your child comes to us five days a week, what are they doing on so their off classes. days? Because right. that causes a transportation issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so they get back to Sumner High School, that's great, but then is there a bus to take them home? Mm -hmm. Like, how does that work? Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, there are some that have gone back five days a week, and there are a couple that are hybrid like we are. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just curious how they'd be re meeting their minutes. Obviously, the ones that are in school every day are going to have no problem. Yes. But. They, and, and some have started live work right up. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a little amazed mm -hmm. at what some CTEs are doing. Mm -hmm. um, I would not want to start right now with right. live work. I feel like routines need to be built, safety protocols. Mm -hmm. I feel like everybody needs to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. And then I think by October, you start slowly. Mm -hmm. I kind of have a phased idea in my mind of mm -hmm. what this might look like. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't, I wouldn't advocate starting right away. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that live work component, we've got to really think about how to do that safely, meeting the health and safety guidelines, but also meeting our certification requirements. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is um, Mrs. Corman Ramos, I believe. Yes, and, and she's, she's joining, joining us by, by Zoom. Yep. Rachel, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Yay, okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be able to join you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our opening day's training. Our new teacher orientation was held on Tuesday, August 27th, and the information was um, provided on payroll, human resources, PD and focus, and completing and discussion of a new teacher checklist. We are excited to meet our new teachers and ed techs who've joined us, and they bring with them a diversity of experience and expertise. Um, we're going to continue to provide uh, training and support throughout the year for this group through our new teacher cohort, which was very successful last year with Debbie Richards, our instructional coach, leading it. Um, every month we have a visitor. Um, we have someone from IT. We have uh, I come and talk about PD opportunities. Um, we have different people come from around the district to support our new teachers. Anytime they have questions, they can request that someone comes visits and gives them some uh, small group time about questions they have around jump rope, that kind of thing. And so that was very successful last year and we will continue it this year. Um, during opening days of school on August 31st and September 1st, Stacy Wood, our social worker at EMS, and Brenda Frost, the guidance counselor from EEMS, presented how we support students as we return to school to our entire faculty. It was a live web-based presentation with resources and ideas for connecting and engaging with students as they walk through our doors after so long away from our buildings. Um, with the help of Amy Van Dorn, the social worker at EHS, they compiled links to activities, videos, opportunities to share their ideas, um, they had ideas about having kind of a mindful minute with um, something that the kids could think about as they're coming into Zoom classes, um, ways for them to kind of self-regulate. It was really well done presentation. They put lots of hours into it and um, uh, it was a very meaningful training opportunity and I do want to thank them for sharing their expertise and their time. Um, the day before school started, I shared for the first time my new Google Classroom called the Ellsworth Teacher Toolkit. It contains topics including social and emotional learning resources, how-to guides for instructional applications, articles about distance learning, materials for teachers to share with parents, and content materials for educators in grades K through 12. Um, in creating this, with the tremendous amount of help from Laura Johns, our extremely knowledgeable new technology integrator, I was able to understand some of the ins and outs of the Google Classroom and how our own teachers are able to reach students with this tool and how I can now share materials with educators in a one-stop shop location. Um, I know they get tired of me sending them lots of emails with new ideas and new articles, and so now there's kind of a a, a central resource that they can go to when they're looking for something on a particular topic that they want to learn about or share with their colleagues or if they want to send, um, you know, how to use Google Classroom to a parent who may not have seen the video at the beginning of the year, all those things will be in one place. Um, and for the board members, I've shared that link with you in my board report so that you can join and you can also see the kinds of things that um, we'll be sharing across the district. Also, um, our principals will have an opportunity to post uh, resources that they want their teachers to see, and it'll be a place that all of us can share um, our ideas in the school district. Oh, I'm also very pleased to say that we've just gotten um, 
provisional uh, approval from the state on our um, Title I, Title II, Title IV, and Title V grants. So we'll be able to use that money um, to fund our Title I program, our professional development programs, and a lot of our student engagement and STEM programs that we're excited to start this year. Do you have any questions? I do. Um, I was curious, with all of the new things that we um, have implemented, is there any um, chance at some point in the near future we could do a survey for staff and teachers to see how that's all going. Um, I know obviously our administrators are checking in and I'd like obviously all of them to do that, but um, with all of these new implementations and the new technology, is there a chance to survey staff and, and teachers coming up in the near future to check in? We certainly have the capability to do that. Um, and um, I'm certainly happy to help make that happen um, when we all decide that should happen. Absolutely. I think we definitely want to um, make sure we're constantly checking in with our families. Um, I happened to be in the high school today when, during advisory, as Mr. Clifford was discussing, and when each of the advisory um, groups were asking their students how things were going. Um, and so from the student side, everyone was so engaged. It was really exciting to walk through the halls, and nobody even wanted to say hello to me. It was the best day that I felt completely uh, ignored because they were so engaged in what the kids were saying and um, paying attention to, you know, how people were doing this week. I know everyone's been very anxious to make sure that the things that we hoped would go well really were going well. And so I, I definitely share with you the desire to know that what we're working on is going the way we'd hoped. Um, so I'm absolutely, you know, available to implement those things and, and design one as I have in the past. And um, in collaboration with our leadership team and, and with the board. So I will await further instructions. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Rachel. So was, Thank you. was Annie Sargent not available? Unfortunately, uh, because of the number of postponements, um, she had another commitment that could sure. not be changed this evening. Okay. I, I will say that um, I did have a chance to visit her uh, new site and while uh, they're up and operating. They're still uh, in the process of doing some construction, but uh, her program is up and operating well. And uh, as you've heard from our other administrators, uh, she's very excited and her staff is very excited and it's been a positive start for her. Excellent. And, and just to let people know, again, she is in a new location. She used to be on the back side of the Mill Mall on the EMS side. <clears throat> she is now on the uh, front side on the north end. And it's, it's a great location uh, for the program. And there will be a new sign up there uh, if you drive by and look at that end, you'll see a large white signboard that is clear right now. Mm -hmm. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have a brand new adult education sign there. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Markosian. Uh, I'm going to, uh, my first comments are going to echo a lot of what you heard from our uh, principals and administrators. Uh, but in a time when we are all still adjusting to the many new normals, and after a long summer of reviewing guidance, drafting and revising plans, adjusting to changes in guidance, and I'll reiterate that two, three, four times because that happened many times over the summer, and believe it or not, it still happens uh, as early as, as recently as today. Uh, and planning to begin the year in a safe and healthy manner for our students and staff, one normal, um, and it's a very comforting one at that, uh, is the start of a new school year. Uh, in the last week of August, we held our first ever, uh, out of necessity, virtual new staff orientation day. And on the following uh, Wednesday, our first ever, uh, first day with all of our staff members, uh, and they went very well. Uh, both of them we intentionally made uh, short enough and meaningful enough so that we could welcome our staff back, new staff and our existing staff, uh, but let them get back to work to continue preparing for students, and I think it was very much welcomed. And I'm certainly hopeful that um, as well as those went, we never have to do a virtual first day with staff again. It's much more enjoyable to have all the people there. Uh, but with that being said, um, finally this week, as you heard from our principals, we welcomed our students and staff back to school physically. You know, the anticipation and excitement we all feel for the first days of school is always at a high level. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a parent, you're a kid, you're a teacher, you're an administrator, or whatever your role is, 
you know, you're always excited about the first days. Uh, but I have to tell you this year, because we've not had students in our schools since March, uh, the anticipation and excitement was even at a higher level. I, I was very pleased to have had the opportunity to spend much of Tuesday and Wednesday mornings in our schools uh, and truly excited to see students and staff back in a familiar place. Um, I did have the opportunity to speak to Mr. Hudson. Um, I noticed he was uh, at EEMS on, I believe it was Tuesday morning, Mr. Hudson. Um, in addition to being there observing, uh, I think he was also uh, called into duty to help clean up some of the uh, remnants left from our winged visitors. Uh, but I, I would echo what he said. It went extremely well. Um, it was really evidence that our uh, staff did an incredible job preparing for the start of school. Uh, very seamless. Uh, you, know, you, you always hope through planning that things are going to go well, you know, particularly in what we've been dealing with. Uh, but you always expect there are going to be some glitches, and there will be, but it just seemed very seamless, and it was a great way to start the school year. Um, I, I spent a good part of the morning walking through EEMS, uh, talking with staff, talking with kids, and even though you could not see through the mask and see the smiles, you knew that they were there. Kids were excited to be back. Teachers and staff were excited to be back. Um, if you take away the pandemic and you take away the masks, it really felt like a great first day of school. I uh, had the opportunity to do the same thing at the high school. Um, and once again, the, the, the feedback and what you observe, things are going uh, very well. Kids are happy to be back. Teachers and staff are happy to be back. Uh, same thing at HCTC. So I have to say, uh, with all that we've been dealing with since March and all the work that's been put into place, and I'll, I'll reiterate what some of our administrators have said, you know, not just our leadership group who really gave up their summers this summer to do all the planning to help get things ready to go, and, and I appreciate all the work you guys have done. And those of you who are here with us uh, via Zoom, uh, it goes without saying that we also have to recognize and thank our custodial and maintenance staff, our food service staff, our transportation staff, our teachers, our ed techs, all of our other staff members who have moved heaven and earth to get us ready to start the school year. Uh, you know, I've, I've said it many times, we have an absolutely incredible staff in our school system. Our community should be very pleased with the people you have that are serving your kids. But given what we're dealing with and seeing the first couple of days in person, uh, it, it just reminds you of how great a place this is and how great people we have. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention students. Our students are fantastic as well. Uh, the kids that I talk to, in fact, I can recount one story from a young lady at HCTC. I asked the class, are you guys happy to be back? And she looked at me through her mask and said, not really. So I, I, I asked her why, and she says, well, actually, I'm happy to be back but I do miss the opportunity to be able to sleep in as much as I was. <laughs> so, uh, I, I took that as a positive that she was happy to be back. Uh, but again, you know, while, while we as a school have always known uh, what is going on this year appears different and is different for our students and our staff, we're still focused on the same vision and mission, and our staff is as committed as ever to providing the best possible educational experience for our students. Um, but I'd also like to just say that e even with all the planning that has taken place and all the credit that I'm giving to our staff for doing the incredible amount of work, um, and again, that's not just in preparing the facility, our vehicles, our classrooms, and the professional development that took place. Uh, we know, and, and Jen, this kind of goes back to your question about getting feedback from staff. We know that we're going to need to closely monitor the implementation of the plans. You know, you're hearing from our principals that a lot of things went really well. You also heard from our principals, and I'm glad that they told you, there are some challenges that we're dealing with. Um, we're going to have to monitor those, monitor those things very closely and stay on top of them to ensure that we continue to move in the right direction. And I have absolute confidence in our staff to make sure that we're doing that. Uh, you know, this is a very new experience for all of us, and while we've prepared well, um, we need to stay focused on our students and staff and our families and ensure that we're delivering the best possible educational and co and extracurricular programs for our students. I would also like to say a big thank you to our parents and our students for your patience and understanding as we get the school year started. You know, you, you've heard some of the pieces from our administrators of uh, some challenges. But I would implore you to please, if you have a question or you have a concern or something is not working, please reach out directly to our schools. Call your child's teacher, call your child's principal, call me. We want to work with you because we are as committed as ever to making sure that the education your child receives is the quality that's befitting of the Ellsworth School Department. Um, another piece that I'd like to mention, and, and Rachel talked a little bit about it, is just a little bit about social, emotional, and mental health. You know, one of the concerns that we've talked about in many previous meetings is uh, the social, emotional, and mental health of our students and our staff and our families. 
Um, you know, if you remember a couple of meetings ago, um, our special education director, who used to work in our social and emotional mental health uh, department, Caroline McHecker Murphy, spoke at length about the amount of work that took place over the summer uh, with our guidance staff, our social working staff, uh, to do research, to gather information, to prepare resources for our families. Um, you know, as we transition to the new school year, newly implemented programs, the health and safety and emotional and physical health and safety of our students, it's imperative that we focus on it. Um, I encourage parents, if you have concerns about your child or any concerns about their social well-being, their mental well-being, please utilize the resources that we have available and we will work to help you. Now, we want to make sure that the transition to the new school year and the new normal works very well for your children. And I, I would like to ask if, if uh, Director McEachern Murphy, if you're here with us tonight, I believe you are, would you mind talking just briefly about the uh, resources that we have available for our families? Sure. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't think... We can hear you. Can you hear... Yes. Sure. Can you, can you hear, can you hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> it was taking me a minute to get on there. Um, and, and talking about... Can you hear... The, you? Can you hear? You might have to turn yeah. off your Facebook feed, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was taking me a minute to get on there. Well, while we're waiting, I know, I know that our principals uh, from the schools also sent out There's information. There's something wrong with the feedback, and I, I don't think that I can communicate with you guys effectively. I apologize. You sound very good right now. Okay. Well, we apologize for the technical difficulty, but again, I, I encourage parents, if you have concerns about your child... Okay, if you guys can hear me, we'll keep, I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, Let's do it. So we do have quite a few things going on as far as the social and emotional welfare of the staff as well as the students. And one of the things that we have going is we're bringing on a group who is working specifically for educators. They are offering um, programs on an individual basis where staff can access them live through messaging. They are licensed clinicians and they are able to answer um, concerns people may have around mental health as well as make referrals to the appropriate people in the community. They can make referrals to our own EAP program, but the really special part of what they are planning to do is really tailoring their uh, presentations and how they support the staff to what the staff wants and needs. And that will be an ongoing, as you've heard everybody say tonight, that it takes um, some time for things to get off the ground. This is going to be an ongoing process. And um, I, I really think the expertise of the people who are clinical um, in this, this particular program they're also uh, involved and have been involved in the education system. And to have that unique understanding of how mental health and education really, um, they're very similar, but at the same time, they're very, very different. So to have that knowledge and the people who can help serve the staff, I think, is, is going to be critical to the well-being of the whole community um, of Ellsworth schools. Um, we also have um, Abby Kavaya, who is offering her yoga uh, classes to staff, and I've seen many staff answer on some threads that they're going to join with her. So we're looking at different ways to help support staff as they work through all of the, this whole new world of learning that we are operating under. I think that pretty much uh, we also have a help desk ticket that we are working on um, pulling together so that teachers can directly access the clinical staff in the buildings and um, the clinical staff can then follow up. So it's a great way to track our students who are having troubles and um, be able to keep track of how they're improving and whether or not we need to be referring out for more intensive support. So it's a pretty comprehensive system and we do have, as Mr. Higgins noted earlier, we have had clinical staff working on this 
since last March and have recently come together and, as, as noted previously, done the social-emotional learning training. And um, they have quite extensive knowledge among them in, in trauma. And um, with this knowledge, I feel that they have the ability to shepherd the community of staff members and students in um, Ellsworth to a better future through this really difficult time. Does Thank anyone have any questions? Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and in concluding my report, we'd just like to uh, report on new staff that were hired since the last time we met. We have a number of them. Uh, Christy Hackett is joining Ellsworth High School in the Food Service Department. Great. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <She's gonna delay. laughs> uh, a number of new educational technicians. Mark Voida, EdTech 380 EMS. Cheryl Harris, an EdTech 380 EMS. Samantha Shepard, EdTech 380 EMS. Courtney Willey. EdTech 3 EMS and Matthew Walton, EdTech 3 at EMS. Leah Varnum is joining Ellsworth High School as the new JMG instructor. And uh, two new custodians, one at EHS, one at EMS. Timothy Hobbs is at EHS, and Michael Goslowski is at EEMS. We still have uh, a few teaching vacancies. Uh, we're looking for three special education positions. One is a K through 4 behavior teacher, one is a K through 4 life skills teacher, and one is a 5 through 8 resource room teacher. And uh, we're also looking for a math teacher at Ellsworth High School. Uh, in closing for my report, again, I just want to reiterate uh, my thanks and appreciation to all of our staff for doing the great work they did to get the school year ready to go. Uh, thanks to our student body who uh, have been great so far in doing what they need to do. And, and especially thanks to our parents and families out there for their patience and understanding uh, in, in knowing that it's a new school year, it's a different way of doing things. Uh, <coughs> but with your support, with your understanding and your kindness, and your willingness to call and let us know if there are questions that you have or concerns that you have. We're going to move forward and we're going to have a great school year uh, in the Ellsworth School Department. So thank you very much. And I would entertain any questions you guys have. <coughs> I do have a question. Um, you mentioned resignations. Yep. Do oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, we had three resignations. One, um, an ed tech at EEMS, Ilya Sipe, has resigned and taken a teaching position elsewhere. Um, Terry Beal, who's been a, a long-time administrative assistant in the special education department, has, uh, will be resigning and um, going off into a different employment opportunity. And Paula O'Neill in our food services department um, has also uh, moved on and taken another employment opportunity. All right, thank okay. you. We appreciate the work that they all did for us over the years. Any other questions? Thank you, thank you for the reminder. <laughs> I was sitting in a different pile. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, committee reports. Curriculum has not met. No. Policy has not met. Yeah. I, I, I think what I would say is I, I believe our, our standing committees, uh, we have not had um, any report, uh, excuse me, any meetings. I know uh, back when we were meeting with policy, I do recall with um, Jen and Abby, Abby made the comment, and I forget how long ago it was, July. and they suggested that we focus on getting the school year up and running. Right. So. Uh, I think now that we're up and running and, uh, and we get another week under our belt, we'll start back up with the policy <laughs> review process. I know that facilities and maintenance will be looking to you for uh, uh, reviewing a couple of bids for equipment that Mr. Turnbull is looking for. So we'll start that process up. So I do appreciate an understanding of the board of letting those committees uh, set aside for a minute while we got things up and running. And um, now that we're up and running, I think that's... Uh, We'll get back to hopefully what we call normal business. Okay. And I emphasize the word normal. Okay. Old business? Okay. Uh, before we go on to new business, perhaps this would be a good time to um, mm -hmm. do the public participation sure. part of the meeting. I've got six messages. I'll start with, the, with them in the order in which they came in. First one is from Nicole Robichaud. She says, thank you to EEMS. -E My daughter is a seventh grade student and her teacher was scheduled to be Mrs. Johns, who we learned earlier is now our technology coordinator. We were notified she would have a new teacher just days before school started. Not only did the first day go smoothly, but I saw joy I hadn't seen on her face in months. Masks, extra hand washing and social distancing Thank you for showing that kindness does start with all of you and for doing so much for our students. All of your efforts do not go unnoticed. 
Nikki Robichaux. So uh, I'd say thank you for that message. That's really heartwarming to hear that. And the next one is from Nicole Knight. I have two children in middle school, and I found out on Tuesday that they were going to be let out the side door and allowed to walk across to where the Mill Mall is. On Tuesday, Mr. Cushing was there to guide the children across the road and also help with traffic control. However, on Thursday, there was nobody there. I'm a little concerned about that and was wondering if there was going to be anything done in regards to the safety of the children crossing. So, Ms. Gabianelli, I see you coming to the podium. <laughs> yeah, so um, on Thursday, he would have been there too. It's just a little scheduling glitch. Uh, he had to leave early on Thursday, and we didn't realize it until after. Um, students in the middle school are exiting the music room doors right. to avoid kind of crossing paths with um, the elementary students who are coming down for pickups and, and walkers as mm -hmm. well. But students can walk around to the parking loop. So if parents would prefer to pick their child up in the parking loop, the middle school students are just walking around to the parking loop and waiting till their parents get in the loop. Otherwise, we are helping them cross the road in two places so that they can get to the mill mall safely. It was just honestly one of those blips that we didn't realize until we were in mid-dismissal. Yeah. So I do mm -hmm. apologize for that. Um, we certainly will get that worked out, not a problem. Um, but there will be somebody there on a consistent basis. There was, he was there today. We just, like I said, it was a scheduling blip. Right. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next message from Gwen Clark. Has any other extracurricular activities for students been considered, for example, performing arts? Well, Mrs. Wright's coming to the uh, podium to answer the performing arts piece. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that we are talking about, and we talked about this with our uh, principals earlier today, is our intent is to provide our, and, and set athletics aside for a second because that's a separate topic tonight, but our uh, clubs and activities, the intent is to provide those activities in a safe and healthy manner consistent with the guidance um, as soon as possible so we can get them started. I think the feeling of our principals was we want to get the school year up and started first but we will be uh, moving forward and you'll get information um, from your school with regard to those clubs in, in a very near future. But that, that is our intent. Again, consistent with the guidelines, but offering the activities that we have for children. So Mr. Higgins pretty much answered it, actually. Sorry, um, <laughs> there, are, there are definitely guidelines from the DOE regarding um, visual and performing arts, which I believe is a question in particular. Yep. And our people are definitely looking at that and trying to devise ways that we can still offer those activities, but offer them safely, doing much of it outdoors, socially distanced, as we're supposed to do. Um, I know there's a lot of talk. I was supposed to have a drama committee meeting this week with the MPA, and then they got moved because I think they had a lot of other things going on this week. Um, but looking at doing, for instance, the one-act play festivals, there may be some virtual possibilities for doing that and having that take a different format. I know that they are looking at the same thing with music, with concerts and things, or doing them outdoors in, on some of the fields and different venues and things. So I think it will look very different, but we are still definitely going to be able to provide all of those for all the students. And I know Mr. Clifford was out marking some spaces for some instruments to be able to practice um, on the football field today. <laughs> so um, I think you'll hear them out there next week rehearsing band up at the high school. Mm -hmm. and, and I know we're talking with Mrs. Gabianelli about, about offering at the middle school as well, kind of trying to help them with this is what we're doing, this is possibly what you can do. But none of that will be certain until tonight we'll get past tonight and, yeah. and get the okay and then we'll move forward so so i actually had a little thought about that when we were sure. thinking about the performing arts because for multiple summers now we've had the outdoor movies at the um Milton park and it sort of has an amphitheater <laughs> it's not really carved out very well but one of the thoughts i had had was if it was ever possible and maybe April could answer this IT question. If we had students say like a one act play mm -hmm. and it was going on at the auditorium, mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, so it's at right. the high school and they're, they're doing their thing, could it maybe then be live streamed so that we could sit outside at the amphitheater? Because I know they do the movies I there. think that would be great fun. And yeah. the only restriction would be it would have to be a play that is not copyrighted. Right. 
True. Right. right. It, would ha it would have to be something that is in public domain, mm -hmm. but that is also something we are looking at to be able to to Stream do things or, that can yeah. be streamed or can yeah. be sent out. Yeah. That to would be the that would be the only restriction that. we would have. Mm -hmm. And many people are putting out things that can be right now. Like we're getting inundated with things from from play services oh, and sure. authors wanting to sell their virtual show that they allow you to do that way. So there, mm -hmm. there's a lot out there to. Mm -hmm. To wade through as in everything that we're doing mm -hmm. so yeah okay well thank, thank you, you. And yep. <clears throat> thank Ms. Clark for um, posing that question mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are wondering it I was actually gonna <laughs> ask a similar question this evening for uh, your report Dan but I saw her question I saw she had sent that so I thought well I'll let her <clears throat> pose it because I have a son who's wondering that mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll bet yeah <laughs> <laughs> right, next question from uh, Amanda Steinbeck. My daughter is in gray group fourth grade. Since she hasn't gotten her computer for, remote, for her remote days, um, she, ar she already owns a Chromebook at home. Can she log on with her personal computer so she can have more work on her days that she isn't in school? I think Mrs. Clifford is doubly uh, qualified to answer that. Uh, yeah. she's got a little experience in she's IT. Really trying to get that. To I know. Be done with that. This was, right. the You're up here as the for, as the elementary school principal. That's right. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. Teachers aren't, aren't prepared to do that because all students don't have their devices in fourth grade, so they're really thoughtfully planning that work based on the work that they're doing in class and they're building up on that. So it's kind of a not yet question. Um, they'll be able to log in to eSpark. If they wanted to practice those types of sites like utilize eSpark or utilize Raz Kids or Epic, I'm sure that they can help them set up their code so they could do that type of work on a personal Chromebook. That's not a problem, but um, as in doing specific assignments um, that were different from what kids were doing. We're trying to keep that work consistent for teachers right now mm -hmm. so that when they're coming in and they're grouping kids that they have all the same background and premises to build upon the prerequisite skills. Mm -hmm. So if they wanted support with that, I would recommend that they could email their homeroom teacher and then they could share those links and codes with them so that they would be able to practice additionally if they would like. But for, for specific assigned homework to be able to log in that way, it's not something I think that we're ready to do yet mm -hmm. kind of on the same note um, could you maybe just for everybody's benefit kind of walk parents through how to get into infinite campus because I've already had a few questions and people like me I don't remember my daughter's password <laughs> I don't know what they set the I'm not sure what they set the things it's at lunch number and the um, IC is on clever and I says, okay. So if you go to the Clever website, which is linked off the school website, you should be able to use your lunch number to get in. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't sure how they set it up this year because it gets done So we go to the school website. Yes. Click on what was that again? It's listed under Clever Student Support. Clever Student Support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you click on Clever, and then you should be able to find it. And if it's not, it will be there in a second when I sit back down. <laughs> so I still have the power. <laughs> And but. get your get your child's lunch number from them. And if you if you don't if you don't know it, I mean, just send a help ticket in. Um, if you email the help at elsewhereschools.org, I mean, they have people um, setting up accounts and doing those things, and and they can do those remotely uh, during any time. And mm -hmm. the best way is to really send a help ticket because they have more people looking at it versus trying to call and connect with a live person. Um, if you have trouble and you need troubleshooting, that's fine too. But the best way really to get account creation or account help is doing that. And I'll I can have them post um, a link on the school site so that they know how to do that um, on the news feed. I'll, I'll ask um, IT to do that and or I can do it in a minute. But I just want to make sure that people have that access. And can you say what the address was again for submitting to IT for help? Um, the, the email address, yeah, the email address is help, H-E-L-P, at ellsworthschools.org and that'll create a help ticket and then an IT um, staff member will be able to communicate with you to do that. That's the best way because there's <coughs> If you send an email or a phone call, you're dealing with one person. When you send a help ticket, there's five people that can look at it. Mm -hmm. So you have support that way. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Higgins, I might make a suggestion that going forward at the next board meeting at the workshops, that we include our new IT uh, manager in these meetings, because I think we're going to have a lot of these questions. 
And, and actually, she, she uh, if, if necessary, she is actually here tonight. She's manning Perfect. the uh, video feed and Perfect. Facebook feed. So uh, if we need her to come in, we can do so. But it's a great so suggestion. Just, just we can, we can let April, April just leave her principal's <laughs> hat on and not have to keep well, switching all the time. And I think that's a good idea, but I think one of the pieces is sometimes it's hard for people to let go of things they've done sure. for a long time. So there may be some of that there, right, April? True. <laughs> all right, here's the next one. Hi, Paul. This is Elizabeth Altieri, and I don't, I actually don't have a question this time. I have thrown a lot at our administrators with my own concerns over returning to school as well as my children's, and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank them for being so responsive and willing to talk things out with me and my children. Both my third grader and my sixth grader had a fantastic week, and I appreciate everything that is being done by the teachers, staff, and administrators to make this situation so much better than we could have imagined. Thank you. Very nice to hear that. Again, um, that's, a, that's a credit to our staff. Next one is from Susan Tripp. The Ellsworth School community is fortunate to have you all caring for our children. Those children are the glue that holds us all together. It was an outstanding launch to a most challenging school year. Congratulations, in all caps, and thank you all. And then she uh, adds virtual standing ovation. <laughs> so again, thank you very much for that. That's, it's really heartening to get those messages. That's all I have. Well, actually, that's a nice segue because uh, thank you, Mrs. Tripp. You reminded me of something that I wanted to mention. Uh, We've talked in previous meetings about a grant application we submitted to support uh, the daycare uh, services. And if you remember the last meeting, Mrs. Tripp asked if, uh, in addition to the YMCA, if other licensed providers who were meeting the eligibility standards could be part of this. Uh, the grant was submitted last Friday, and, and credit to Mrs. Corman Ramos for putting that together. Uh, we, we learned at probably, uh, I got an email at probably 515 at home this afternoon, letting us know that we have received temporary approval and we should be receiving a formal notice next week. So I don't know just how the dollars are going to translate, uh, but it sounds as though we're going to get some support to help uh, offset those costs for the program at the Y and also for Mrs. Tripp's daycare. So uh, it's great news. And uh, yes. thank you, Mrs. Tripp, for the reminder. I would have forgotten it if you didn't uh, send something in. Dan, I have a question, actually, follow up to that that I meant to ask the last meeting. If there's another licensed daycare out there do they contact you Rachel who how would that great question Jen uh, contact Rachel and again mm -hmm. the way that we've built the grant we've, we've built in capacity for X number of students um, but there is some flexibility in there so that, and we did try to Rachel did try to reach out to some other providers and mm -hmm. didn't get response um, if they are have her contact her um, and if they meet the eligibility standards and are serving the students who are eligible for the support mm -hmm. um, we should have funding to support that as well okay thank you Next is item J, new business. One, acknowledgement of personnel committee action on behalf of board. And we do not, the personnel committee did not meet. We did not have a candidate to bring forward, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, two, consideration of teacher nomination. The same. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, three, discussion and consideration of authorizing personnel committee to act on behalf of the school board in confirming teacher nominations in the month of September. Uh, this is something we've asked of you, uh, I think, once in the past five years. The reason we're asking you to extend that authorization to September is you heard me talk about four teaching positions that we still do not have filled. Um, you know, obviously, we'd like to move quickly if we do get qualified candidates, so we're asking to extend that opportunity to allow your personnel committee to act on your behalf in the month of September. And again, your next board meeting is not scheduled till the second Tuesday of October. So, you know, if we found somebody next week, we don't want to wait until that board meeting. Because that candidate might go someplace else. Because be other districts are looking for staff also. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so we need has, a motion. Well, I actually have discussion on that. So, has it been in the past though that there can't be a special meeting for just a teacher nomination? You could call a special meeting. I think logistically, it's. Uh, more challenging than allowing your personnel committee to do it. Mm -hmm. But again, that's, that's up to the board. I think I would be more okay with it if we were going to be given a heads up on a person and have a time in which we could weigh in with input before a decision is met. I think 
you know, it's 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 going at something blind that I'm not terribly comfortable with. And I guess the only thing I would say to that is when, when we go through the process and bring you a teacher, certainly we send you the bio on that teacher, but our, our administrators and their hiring committees at the building level have gone through the process, they've reviewed applications, they've put standards in place, they've done interviews, they've done reference checks. I do a separate reference check. So whether it goes through the committee or, or we come back to the full board in October, you know, either way, you know, the, the notification is going to get to you folks before you have to vote yes or no on a confirmation. I think I, do, I just know we typically, it seems like it's been done over the summer because we don't, mm -hmm. wouldn't normally met, meet as often we obviously had. Well, and we then, meet as often. It's just that we, we've, got, we've got this, the same, it, when we get teacher um, applications in the spring, um, typically school districts are trying to get those, ap those positions filled, um, but they've got time to do it and the, the, the applicants have time to apply elsewhere if they don't get the position that they were hoping to get. Mm -hmm. But once you come up against the start of the school year or just already into the school year, it becomes a little bit more um, challenging and we don't want to lose a good applicant because we are not able to give them, I mean, we can give them reassurance that the screening committee and the superintendent want to hire you, but it just has to wait for board approval, which won't happen until the second Tuesday of October. Um, for some people who understand how this process works and that typically the, a board will approve what these, um, what the screening committee and, um, has recommended. Um, but some might feel uncomfortable with that and, you know, it just, it would be a shame if we lost a, a good candidate, um, because of those, um, because of those concerns. And again, for the, for the summer, it's a pretty typical action because, you know, sometime in a, in a normal summer, again, who knows what a normal summer is, we don't know from this summer. Um, when you're trying to call references and so forth, you may have somebody who's on vacation that you need to speak to and not be able to get to them. Um, so sometimes that timing doesn't work out for your regularly scheduled board meetings. As I said, we've only asked for this once in the s seven years I've been back here. Mm -hmm. um, we're asking for it this time because it's a unique circumstance. Um, but again, I would also remind you that the, the hiring process goes this way. You have, you have a nomination that's made by the superintendent for a teacher. Uh, you have a confirmation of that nomination by the board or the personnel committee. Um, and then the next piece is if the board confirms it, then I would employ the person. So the process will work the same way, whether it's you authorizing the personnel committee to do it or calling a special meeting or waiting until the, the next month. Okay. It'll be the same process and, and the same information that comes out. And the board's, the board's opportunity to weigh in, as you say, Abby, is voting yay or nay. But we're asking to waive that, right? No, no by, by you authorizing the personnel committee to act on your behalf, you're granting them that authority. Right. But it's no different than this September than any September, really. Except that right now we have, you know, we're, we're early in September. Our next meeting is not until October, and I'm not sure what the date is. We have those positions out there right now. If we can get somebody next week, we would love to be able to do it and get them in place. You know, October one, 13th is the next board meeting. I think if we were to be given the person's bio and if we had no objections, then I would be comfortable letting them act on our behalf but unfortunately that's not what this is set up for but yeah you're asking us to to not I mean if we could make an amendment to it I'd be it's up to the board how you want to handle it I just, I don't, I can, I could understand when we were trying to get the planning process going and for the return of school and everybody was, the plates were full. I just don't, I, I personally don't see needing to do that for the month of September for this year. Well, I, I would be happy to uh, withdraw the recommendation and we can call a special meeting. That's fine. Good. I agree with that. I got one more uh, public comment concerning the topic we were just discussing from Sheila Gallagher. Uh, Samuel Wagner just posted a 5-6 resource position. We need to grab folks when we can if they are qualified. Trust me, I'm not recommending anyone I would not work with. So that's a comment on what uh, discussion we just had. 
And then we go to um, uh, J New Business uh, number four, discussion and consideration of fall athletics. Uh, I'd like to take the lead on that, if I may, Mr. Marcosi. Yes, and, please uh, do. Members of the board, I believe you received the recommendation um, earlier this afternoon. I appreciate your patience and understanding of the time it took to get it together. Um, as we talked about, it was frustrating, and I know it was frustrating for members of our public to have to postpone meetings twice. We appreciate your patience out there, members of the public. Uh, but now that we've got the information, um, had a chance to review it and meet with our administrators at EHS and EMS uh, this morning. Uh, and we reviewed and came up with uh, a recommendation for the board's consideration. Uh, we do have members of uh, our administration here, uh, principal, assistant principal, athletic administrator from Ellsworth High School, uh, Ms. Gavinelli, principal uh, from EEMS, uh, grades five through eight, and also uh, Travis Wood, assistant principal, athletic administrator at Ellsworth Middle School. He is online uh, if you have questions. What I would like to do is uh, read through the document that was uh, sent to the board today along with our recommendation, and, and we can uh, address it from there. So uh, the recommendation for fall athletics for 2020. The final version of the Maine Principals Association School Sports Guidance Return to Competition for Competitive Athletics and Activities in Maine was released yesterday afternoon. The document is recommended guidance that's coming from the Maine Principals Association regarding a health, safe and healthy manner in which Maine students may return to competitive athletics in the fall of 2020. In crafting the document, the Maine Principals Association worked with the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, the Maine Department of Community and Economic Development, the Maine Principals Association Sports Medicine Advisory Committee, and quoting the uh, document they sent out, and drew on the expertise of the National Federation of State High School Associations and the Maine Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. Additionally, through the process, the Maine Principals Association sought feedback from Maine School Management Association, which is the umbrella organization to you as board members, Maine School Boards Association, and also the Maine Superintendents <coughs> Association. The guidance document that was submitted is in general alignment with the general guidance for community sports activities, uh, which was issued by the Department of Community and Economic Development in July and was updated most recently on September 1st. While it's in general alignment with that, it also includes additional protections uh, for health and safety since school sports take place on school property and participants interact with other students who have not volunteered for these voluntary activities. As referenced in the document, and I quote, adoption of the school sports guidance, like other state developed or recognized guidance, is voluntary and a precondition for any school sports to take place. If a school district cannot feasibly implement and enforce the guidance, it should not allow sports in its schools. Each school district should also align the school sports with other elements of its plan, return to school plan. For example, a school district's limits on the number of people in school facilities for in-person instruction should apply to school sports as well. And the school district's rules for transportation and use of spaces like locker rooms should apply to school sports. Since each school district plan has its unique differences, the school administrative unit will adjust this guidance as necessary for its own set of school sports. As I spoke to some folks who are outside this evening, you know, we all want to see a safe and healthy return to school and you've heard our administrators talk about what they've done and put in place to make that happen. We all also want to see a safe and healthy return to co and extracurricular activities for our students and staff. We all recognize um, and have all been, many of us have also benefited from the importance of school and activities for the social, emotional, and physical well-being of our students. Not only do we provide education, but the activities that we provide to support that provide a measurable benefit for our students. In planning for the academic school year and creating the return to school plan, our planning team and all the people who worked as umbrellas for that have consistently followed the main Department of Education, DHHS, and CDC guidelines and requirement, even as they continue to change and evolve. Okay. Again, everything we brought forth to you as a board, everything that we've asked you to approve has followed that guidance. The recommendation we're presenting to you here this evening to approve the school sports guidance return to competitive, excuse me, return to competition for competitive athletics and activities in Maine is consistent with that approach. We're recommending this because we're asking you to follow the guidance. Okay. In making this recommendation, our administrators uh, understand the need to further review details to ensure, and I'm going to put in quotes, that we can feasibly 
implement and enforce the guidance. Included in some of those categories are high-risk populations, which includes consideration regarding participation in sporting activities as a participant, a coach, or possibly a spectator. General guidance, which includes abiding by current executive orders and CDC guidance on group gathering limits. And if we're talking outdoor activities, we're talking no more than 100 people. Uh, social distancing and spacing, and face coverings. Another category is communication of COVID-19 policies to all student participants, coaches, and officials, and spectators. Again, and spectators is, an, is another whole conversation. There are also operational considerations that we have to consider, such as training for participants, <coughs> coaches, and officials. Continuation of the symptom screening that we're asking students and staff to do before they come to school. Hand washing and sanitizing hygiene and having those mechanisms in place to allow that to happen. Procedures for contract, excuse me, contact tracing. Okay. CDC procedures for confirmed, and we hope this never happens, positive COVID-19 case. Okay. Uh, procedures for practice and event logistics and space, spacing, excuse me, and also pro proper signage and markings on our facilities that we're using. Okay. There are also facilities considerations, which include the availability of water, access to a restroom facility, and the capacity of our facilities to manage the group gathering size limits, cleaning and disinfecting of equipment. Okay. Equipment and supplies, there are procedures with regard to the use, the cleaning and disinfecting of equipment and supplies. Cohorting of participants and coaches, there are recommendations uh, in this guidance that address that. And also, as we talked about a little bit earlier, transportation. The same rules that apply to transportation for our students coming to and from school also apply for co- and extracurricular activities. Additionally, and um, Mr. Frost may be able to update us, update us on this, each of the fall sports offered also has sport-specific requirements that need to be met. Some of them were included as attachments in the document released by the MPA. There are some that are in the form of the Interscholastic Division of the MPA Sports Bulletins on the MPA website. And I know, Mr. Frost, four of the six fall sports have been updated as of this morning. I don't know if the other ones have been updated yet or not. Uh, the football was just updated at... You have to go to the microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's your first time, Josh. Go ahead. Rookie mistake. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the football was just updated, I believe, at 4 o'clock, or at least it was emailed to us at around 4 o'clock. So th those are also other pieces that need to be considered so that we can feasibly implement and enforce the guidance. Um, based on our conversation this morning, however, our administrators are confident that that is something that we will be able to do. Certainly moving forward, if there are things that we can't do, we'll have to revise those guidelines. But I think the general intent is look at what it is that we are able to do to feasibly implement and enforce the guidance so that we can offer return to activities in a safe and healthy fashion. And I think we all, we all shared that as a uh, philosophy this morning. So in general terms, the recommendation from school and district administration, and I'm pleased to report that we all reached consensus on this, is that the board adopt and approve the school sports guidance return to com competition for competitive athletics and activities in Maine as presented contingent upon the ability to implement and enforce the guidance and sport specific requirements and modifications. And when you get to the point where you're looking at making a motion or not, that's the language we use. But specifically speaking, and, uh, and again, we have our administrators here that can talk more specifically about this if you have questions. The spe some of the specific sport recommendations will be as follows, and this comes from the guidance. Golf, which is considered a lower risk activity, the recommendation would be in the guidelines to approve play consistent with the guidance and modifications, and competition for the regular, regular season would be with other Hancock County schools. Okay. For cross country, which is also deemed a lower risk activity, the recommendation would be to approve, approve play consistent with the guidance and modifications, competition for the regular season would be with other Hancock County schools, and would be dual meets or potentially tri meets with a staggered racing schedule. Um, I mentioned regular season for golf and cross country because currently the guidance does permit regional and state level competition, unless that's changed this afternoon. Mr. Frost is shaking his head, so it hasn't. With regard to soccer, um, which uh, in the update of the community sports guidelines, 
uh, was moved from a high-risk sport to a moderate-risk sport would be to approve play consistent with the guidance and modifications, which includes competition with Hancock County opponents only, and consistent with the guidance, there is no postseason for soccer. For sideline cheer, which is also a moderate risk sport, and, and typically, if you know, our sideline cheer program in the fall uh, cheers at football games. Well, uh, football we'll get to in a minute, but that's, that's, that's a different uh, subject, but the recommendation is to approve play consistent with the guidance and modifications, um, and if soccer happens to be an approved sport, that would be an opportunity for cheerleaders uh, and sideline cheer to take place at the soccer events. Volleyball, which is also a moderate risk sport, uh, it's an indoor sport, so I, I want to mention that because it's important for people to know. The guidance that we've received has postponed the formal season to the spring of 2021. Uh, I don't know that the specific months have yet been identified, but probably somewhere in March, April. Okay, Mr. Frost is nodding yes. Um, so it postpones the formal season to spring of 2021, but permits coaches to work with team members in the fall for outdoor participation only. So the season would start with conditioning and skill building activities, and administration would review on or about October 1st the potential to play, consistent with the guidance and modifications, outdoor matches with Hancock County opponents only. With football, which is, uh, football is a high risk sport in the guidance. However, I'm, I'm going to, uh, with regard to the high risk sport, the guidance has postponed the formal season to the spring of 2021. However, in the guidance, they have also implemented a seven versus seven flag football opportunity as a moderate risk activity. And what that guidance permits is for coaches to work with team members in the fall for outdoor participation only. Um, the recommendation is that the season would start with conditioning and skill building activities and an administrative review on or about October 1st uh, about the potential to play consistent with the guidance and modifications outdoor seven by seven flag football with Hancock County opponents only. Okay. Okay, so that's Ellsworth High School. Now let me do Ellsworth Middle School and then uh, we can talk about how you want to move forward with this. At Ellsworth Middle School, and again, Jen, you, you asked a good question earlier today and I was able to respond. You know, the MPA does govern high school athletics, um, doesn't necessarily govern middle school athletics, although we model a lot of our programs after that. Um, but also, as we know, as important as our co and extracurricular, and I mentioned co and extracurricular because we're not just talking athletics, that's, that's what the vote is tonight, but we're also talking our other co-curricular programs. They provide wonderful benefits for our students. Um, they're important to our students, they're important to our staff, they're important to our schools, and they're important to our community. And I'll be honest, they're important to me. Um, we want to address middle school programming as well. So with cross country, again, that is a lower risk activity. The recommendation is going to be approving play consistent with the guidance and modifications as provided for the high school activities. Competition would be with other Hancock County schools and be dual or tri meets as I referenced before. With soccer, again, which is a moderate risk, would be to approve play consistent with the guidance and modifications, which includes competition with Hancock County opponents only. And one, one qualifier that I wanna give as we do not know uh, with regard to middle school how many Hancock County middle schools would be able to field teams at an appropriate competitive level? Um, we may look at offering soft soccer as an in-school intramural activity, but it would be an opportunity for our kids to compete and participate. Uh, again, first piece would be to look at what other middle schools in the county would be uh, taking a similar action that we're recommending you to approve. So th th those are the recommendations. And typically you make a motion, then a second, and then you have discussion. Uh, I think my recommendation on this one would be, um, if there are questions that you members of the board have, um, you know, we've got people here who've been part of reviewing these and talking about these. Uh, my recommendation is, uh, if you have questions, let's talk about it. I'll go first. <laughs> I do have quite a few. Um, so the release of this information from the MPA yesterday included the um, words regional. Mm -hmm. So competition could be held at a regional level. Yep. So regional for Ellsworth and the surrounding areas is Northern Maine. 
we're in that northern Maine region. Mm -hmm. I believe also in the wording that it also spoke about the fact that we could also compete against adjacent yep. counties. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious where the Hancock County um, distinction is coming from. I can address it from my level, but I would also invite our uh, principals to talk about it. Um, conversation amongst uh, Hancock County has been that um, with uh, bringing sports back in, there are opportunities to compete um, locally, even though it does say adjacent counties, our intent was to keep it within Hancock County. Hancock County, as we know, um, the number of reported cases is relatively low compared to the state. Mm -hmm. um, and people have been doing a great job, and if people continue to follow the guidance and guidelines, we expect that that will continue. So that was the premise upon which we're making the recommendation. I know that's been the discussion at the superintendent level. Um, principals, would you like to address the conversations you've been having? Or athletic directors? I think you're going to hear the same thing, Jan, about where the rationale comes from. Yeah, so that's exactly the rationale. And talking to other principals in Hancock County, they were looking to keep it just in, in Hancock County for that reason, um, just because of low number of cases. And I believe the athletic directors, um, same thing. When this was all coming into play, um, you know, it looked like there was an opportunity for athletics to happen. They started looking at scheduling and things like that, and they the whole PVC started, you know, countywide first and then went from there. So my question is, though, what are the other counties that we typically play doing? Are all of the counties sticking with only in their county, or are we choosing that in excess of the guidelines? Okay. We're recommending that. Uh, Josh can probably answer the other counties. The recommendation that's coming from us is, uh, because it's, it's been a discussion around Hancock County, that that's what we're recommending. Okay. It, it's consistent with the guidelines. The guidelines do allow you to go beyond that, but th that's that's the conclusion that we all came to. Josh, is, Josh works in. Uh, Josh is also still president of the PVC, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've had a busy summer. Um, so, um, Pano I can't speak for Penobscot County, um, but I can speak for Roostick County. The Roostick County superintendents and the Roostick County League um, has said that they are not coming down to play. Um, any teams in Penobscot or Hancock or, or any of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, you do have some outliers in our league, and we are trying to work with them. You have um, Piscataquis County, which doesn't have a whole lot of teams um, in it, and you have obviously Penobscot has an overwhelming amount of teams. Um, I will say that uh, Searsport is the lone Waldo County um, mm -hmm. Penobscot Valley Conference uh, member, so. Um, working with them, you know, is a challenge. Um, they are looking to go elsewhere, you know, Mountain, Mount View, Belfast, towards, you know, staying in Waldo County as well. Um, so each school is kind of doing things a little bit differently. It just depends on their location. You have, you have some school districts um, or superintendents that are responsible for two different school districts that might be in two different counties even. So it's just, it depends on, it depends on the different schools. What about Washington County, Josh? Uh, Washington County, same thing. They were looking to, to stay in that county, I believe. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so if we limit ourselves to Hancock County, could somebody give us a rundown on these high school sports and who you'd be able to play? Absolutely. All right. So let's we'll start with golf. Um, right now, uh, the golf schools that um, are looking to play golf this season are MDI, Bucksport, uh, GSA, Deer Isle, and presumably us. Um, cross country is the same schools. Soccer is uh, Bucksport, GSA, MDI, Ellsworth. Um, I did hear this afternoon that Deer Isle is in talks of having a school board meeting next week to try to reverse the so they they canceled just soccer um, but their their school board meeting is meeting next week to discuss that um, and then as far as volleyball again that's just providing kids an opportunity to get outside get some conditioning in and we'll revisit that same with football but those um, opportunities as far as volleyball goes I, sp I spoke with both the MDI um, AD and um, GSA AD this afternoon and they're both interested in those opportunities as well but it, it just depends on what is what does this look like come 
October 1st, are we able to do that outside safely, um, you know, with the ground and whatnot? Um, and then as far as the 7v7 seven, seven, seven seven opportunities, um, it would be Bucksport and MDI for football. And so MDI is on board with their sports, including soccer and football? They, well, M M MDI uh, I thought it was is, no, they're, they're moving forward um, right now with golf mm -hmm. and cross country and sailing, right. I believe. Yep. Um, they're looking at um, the potential of doing what we're proposing with soccer and football and I believe volleyball. Yep. Um, they have not made that decision, but again, they, they had their meeting last evening before this guidance came out. So I don't know what their conversations have been. Yep. And I think also my sense is my, my sense is there is a, a bit of support in the community. And I don't I don't want to speak for their board, obviously, but my understanding is there's a lot of support in the community to move forward with those activities. And you may have heard the same thing. I apologize. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and one of the um, schools and districts in Hancock County that hasn't been mentioned is uh, RSU 24, which voted I believe last week to cancel all fall sports. Correct. Yep. So, and the, and the way that that obviously affects us is by opponents, but also with football, we partner, right. uh, we co-op with, with Sumner. So as far as revisiting the 7v7 idea, we're not sure. Again, last year at a football game, we had, um, we're playing eight man and we have 11 kids in pads. So, mm -hmm. um, and that was with some Sumner students. So we with not having them. We were hoping to have five to six Sumner students. We were looking at our numbers as being around the 12 to 15 mark. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we're not sure how many will show up to football because, again, maybe they'll go play soccer this fall. Maybe they'll go run cross country or even play golf. Um, so they may not play football <coughs> because they'll play the actual football season in the spring. And, and I think the other thing with football and volleyball is that because right now the guides are saying they're looking to postpone and potentially have a season in the spring. You know, it, it does give you a little more room to do this skill building uh, conditioning pieces before, you ha before you're able to make a decision on playing the competition. But I think also with soccer, um, you're looking at a maximum number of uh, contests that you can have. Yep, so with, with soccer, they're looking at 10 game max. They did push the, um, the end date, the last playable date is now November 14th, but as we all know, that, that <laughs> may be unreachable. Uh, some years, some years, you know. Um, Are you saying we're going to have a snowstorm? I, I will not be plowing soccer fields. Um, <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, we, so they've allowed us to go that far because there is no playoffs. There is no um, end of the season tournament scheduled. Mm -hmm. so. And that's, again, because of the community sports guidance where if we were playing for a tournament, we can't travel to Aroostook County, judging by that, going by that guidance. Um, to play Presque Isle or Caribou in a, in a quarterfinal. Um, so. so my question is, if typically in a, in a normal season, mm -hmm. in Penobscot County is actually quite a few of the teams that we play. Yep. Herman, Hamden, I mean, for middle school, it's practically all of them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as Dan was saying, the, the, the guidance coming for, from from this recommendation is Hancock County, and that pretty much eliminates, I mean, I'm, what would middle school soccer have for competition? Sure. Wow. So, um, like us, many schools in the county are still waiting for their school board to, to have a similar mm -hmm. discussion, um, but Mr. Wood did some calling this week, and we have at least three teams that we could play within the county. So there was Pematic, who was waiting for their decision, Connors Emerson, who was waiting for their decision, Bucksport, who was waiting for their decision as well. Um, certainly, I think in, in middle school, it would probably be an abbreviated season in terms of interscholastic, but that's why we want to also offer an intramural opportunity. So there may actually be opportunity for both at the middle level, um, and that may actually uh, garner a little bit more participation in some ways um, from some students who wouldn't normally be able to do that. I mean, we also have to think about how kids get to us, um, it's a little bit 
I think the same issues exist sometimes at the high school as well, but for middle school, definitely, like, they're not even close to driving themselves to school, thank goodness. So, um, <laughs> so you know, we have, to, we have to think about those and plan for those, too, and, and provide as much opportunity as possible for everyone to participate. So, um, from our perspective, if we stick with schools in the county, number one, it goes along with those guidelines of health and safety, but number two, it also may provide us an opportunity not only to offer a season with some competitive games, but also an intramural season with all of our students and giving kids opportunities to play in that way that some kids would never have. So I just, I want to make clear, and I'll obviously give someone else the floor here in a minute, that I'm 100% in support of having these kids play. My concern comes with maybe the excess of guidelines that this recommendation is bringing forward. So if you take the active cases in Hancock County and Penobscot County, um, you know, versus their population, our rates are identical. Um, and then obviously Waldo and Washington County, <laughs> it's, it's even lower. So I understand the need to follow the safety guidelines, but the guidelines have been presented to us and it's recommended as regional. So it would appear as though we could, we could put something forward that would allow for a more normal um, you know, season for these students where they can compete against teams that they would typically compete because there's so many guidelines in place to keep everybody safe. So I think, you know, I, I, while I appreciate all of this and it's great, my concern was is when we look at just Hancock County, um, you know, unless this goes forward and not another single county wants to play outside their, their area and we don't have an option, that's okay. But I'd like to leave it open so that we are able to compete. If Penobscot County says, absolutely, you know, we're willing to do it. I, I don't like the limitation of Hancock County. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously I'm sure everybody else has questions too, but before we get too far, I'd also like to know what would a soccer game look like? What's, you know, so that we can have an idea of what those restrictions would be. It's not going to be what you've seen in the past. <laughs> we're, we're getting bubbles. Um, <laughs> to, to, you play that thing where you put them in it? Yeah, the, <laughs> like the big, around. yeah. Um, <laughs> so to address the first concern with staying obviously in Hancock County, mm -hmm. one of the other major pieces that we looked at was busing. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that also limits our roster numbers. Um, you know, boys varsity soccer traditionally has been a 24 to 25 uh, man roster. Same with JV. You know, the up, sometimes J our JV program with the boys has been 30 because mm -hmm. um, we have had a lot of boys interested in soccer. Um, so we looked at that and we had to, how does that work? You know, are we going to only be able to play one game a day? Um, if we go to MDI, can we only just play varsity? I looked at it as, well, if we are going to MDI, they have two separate field locations, so they're, they're a little different. But we could send the JVs to play the 4 o'clock game on the JV field. The bus could return, do what they need to do to sanitize, grab the varsity, bring the varsity, mm -hmm. take the JV back. It, it's multiple trips. It's the same as if it was two buses. Mm -hmm. um, you're obviously only paying one bus driver. so. Um, so we took that into account too. I mean, I, I would love to go to Washington County and play Washington Academy, but that travel to, to East Machias is a long one on a bus where, you know, you're, you are masked, you are sitting next to the window, all of, all of the same mm -hmm. procedures. So that's also just a thing that we kind of talked about with staying in county. It would just be a little bit easier transportation-wise. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't even reached out to Donnie to find out. That obviously, I want to let him get through the first week and say, well, when can we get a bus to go on away matches? Because um, maybe we can't even get a bus until after that first bus run, which puts us at 3.45, 4 o'clock before we can actually have a bus to go to away matches. So Would we have that's an opportunity, too, then, to... Because um, I would anticipate parents being very willing to transport their own children if it meant they could play. So... I know typically that's not something that, you know, coaches per se have allowed. They like the team to travel together. But my 
thinking is if there's kids that are just, they're completely committed and they want to play and their parents are, are all for it, there may be some chance for alleviation of, mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. you know. Yep, and that's a whole <laughs> other discussion. But let me go back to your first question about soccer. <laughs> so um, with soccer, we're still playing 11 on 11. Um, while uh, students are sitting on the bench or on the sideline, they're masked. Um, when they go into the sub area, they can take their mask off. Um, they go in, and it, it's going to look similar to soccer um, with, the, with the changes that we've made. Um, corner kicks, throw-ins that are going to go directly into the box. Mm -hmm. Ellsworth has traditionally had a, a student that can throw right into the box. Mm -hmm. So if you knowingly are going to do that, then you can only have five defenders and five offensive members in the penalty box, and that's just to limit the number that is in there. Mm -hmm. Traditionally with soccer, you may see right a shoulder to shoulder, mm -hmm. I'm marking this person. That's not going to be the case. They're going to ask you to, to back off. Um, that's going to be the coaches and the referees' responsibilities to make sure that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as that kick or throw in goes into the box, you can send others. But that's just to try to, again, while you're standing there doing that heavy breathing, that you're just not all clustered in, in the middle. Um, with uh, drop balls, it's no longer a thing anymore. So they'll automatically give that. So again, you don't have two players standing opposite each other going to kick a ball. Um, so that, that kick automatically goes to, I can't remember the exact phrase, but it goes to one of the teams. Mm -hmm. um, as far as a... the ref could award. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. As far as a wall goes, coaches mm -hmm. are going to have to get creative with that. You're no longer going to have the wall where you have four or five players in a row. You may stagger them by six feet, you know, so you have one person here, one here, you know, so it works similar fashion. Um, so, again, no longer can do that. Um, and, again, it will be... From my understanding, the referees that will control those, and if, if one of those infractions happens where you do set up a wall or you um, have too many players in the box, then the kick is awarded to the other team and it goes the other way. Um, we will no longer do um, introductions the way that we traditionally have, where teams run through a tunnel and out to the middle. Um, we can still do introductions, but the way I'm looking at doing it is that kids go to their positions on the field, mm -hmm. and they're in their positions, and obviously spread out when they're when they're like that. So I will announce, you know, the the name and number. Maybe they just give a little wave, or just that's who they are out there. Mm -hmm. um, so that still happens. I still intend on doing the national anthem. It would happen after we introduce who's on the field. Um, the coin toss captains. Um, is now happening at midfield instead of over by the scorer's table, and you only are allowed one coach and one captain. Mm -hmm. When they are doing that, they must be masked because of that close proximity. Um, I think I don't think that's yeah. slide tackling. Slide tackling, yes. Yeah, slide, slide tackling can no longer happen. Um, so, and that's just a, a deliberate like you're going for the ball, slide mm -hmm. tackling, so that you're causing another player to fall on top of you. Mm -hmm. Um, or in that, because again, we're trying to eliminate that contact to contact, similar to what you would see in football, where you are, you know, you are tackling somebody. Um, I think that's. But players will not be masked. Players, playing. players will not be masked. The other thing with soccer, um, th for this year, we've put in a, at about the 20 minute mark, at a, or at a natural stoppage, I mean the ball's out of play. Um, it's not like a direct kick where you're headed towards your goal. Um, at the 20-minute mark of each half, the referee will stop the clock. Players will go over to the bench. Um, san the balls will be sanitized. Kids will go over and have a chance to um, get a drink of water, mm -hmm. sanitize their hands. It's not a time for like a 30-second timeout like you see in basketball and a coach to drop a play. Mm -hmm. It's they're literally going to wherever their bag is spaced out behind the bench, getting a drink from their water bottle, going over to the hand sanitizer station that we have, will have for both teams hand sanitizing and going back out to play. Okay. One, one other thing with the masks, with, with soccer, masks are not mandated, but they are permitted. Um, so Correct. Mm -hmm. while, so if while, someone while chooses the to. While the student participant is actually playing, mm -hmm. they're not required to wear one. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, with the exception of being at the table for subbing, yep. they're wearing them. Yep. The mouth guards are still mandatory. Yeah. You still need to wear a mouth guard mm -hmm. uh, when playing soccer. It's going to t take our athletic trainers some teaching of students on how to properly remove that, 
sanitize it, mm -hmm. put it somewhere in a case, you know. And, and, and also in the game, a lot you'll see a lot of players that will play with them in their hands because mm -hmm. they don't technically have to have them in unless they're in the play. Mm -hmm. And that's going to that's gonna, gonna be a teaching thing. You can't, you've got to keep it in because mm -hmm. every time you touch, you know, it's... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Surely I'm not the only one. Go ahead. That's all I have for <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have questions. Good questions. Um, so one of the, so I'm going to just lay it out there. I am very much um, in favor of the kids playing, but I'm, I'm very concerned about putting off some of these sports until spring, particularly obviously football and volleyball. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way to make football happen or do we just not, even if we said, yes, we want football to happen right now, are you saying we don't have the numbers? Uh, I'm saying we don't have the guidance to offer tackle football, full contact pads, helmets. When you say guidance, you're saying that the, that the main principals association simply will not allow it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're not sponsoring a season, so therefore we can't. There's nothing. They, yeah, we would have they're nobody not sponsoring to play. the season. Their recommendation is to push the season to that whatever time in the spring. But the the alternative to that is, and, and Mr. Clifford's on the football committee, so he may be able to add some more to this. The alternative is to offer a, a potentially a seven versus seven flag football opportunity, so that kids can at least have some activity this fall while waiting for the season. And Mr. Clifford, do you want to add to that? Sure. And by the way, Mr. Frost serves as the chair of the soccer committee for the MPA. Mr. Clifford is on the football committee. So they've, they've, they've got a little bit of insight to this process, which is helpful. So, so with the football committee, we met a few times about this. And um, just looking at the governance, there's really no way you can play football. And so, um, you know, we're moving all the teams to a March, April season, hopefully. And, um, but we wanted something for them to do in the fall, you know, so these students are not just they're not doing anything. So we thought they could get ready for the football season by still training and doing seven on seven. And, um, you know, they can run plays, they can have practices, they can condition, uh, things like that. So that's what we're hoping for, just a seven on seven and maybe a scrimmage here or there with other teams, you know, within, the, within close proximity. And then, um, yeah, just get ready for the spring season and we even went, we've identified turf fields throughout the state um, because if there's snow, but you can uh, plow a turf field. And so, you know, Hamden and Husson and University of Maine, those are three, you know, in the Bangor area that, you know, we hope to use and, um, you know, go from there. But with the, with the guidance right now, the MPA, there aren't, there aren't any, any high schools playing football in the fall. They're playing seven on seven and then they're going to postpone their season and play in March and April. That's so we wouldn't have other teams to play. Mm -hmm. no. My, a big concern of mine are, is the field conditions in the spring. Mm -hmm. We only yeah. have three. Can we play multiple games on those fields? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And do you think you're pretty confident they're going to let us play on those fields, I guess? I, 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 I would say this, and, and you know, I was an athletic director eons ago, but th there's a great spirit of cooperation in the athletic community. Uh, you know, th those fields, you know, uh, Mr. Clifford mentioned Hamden. Um, I know one down in uh, Rockport. Not Rockport. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I keep wanting to call it the MBNA facility. Northport. But, uh, Northport. Th th those fields are used regularly um, at all different times. So you know, if you get to that type of a situation, you're going to find that school departments are going to work well together to provide opportunities for kids. Again, you, you might play at some different times. You know, you might have a game on a Saturday at 10 in the morning or mm -hmm. 8.30 at night but it's still an opportunity to compete on a field that's not going to be affected by the weather. Right. Between Friday nights and Saturday afternoons, we were hoping to get in multiple games and maybe complete them all. Yep. Also, my other big concern is if, you know, putting up, by putting off onto the spring, um, are we going to lose our football players to other sports? What are we competing with at that time? It, it's actually in between the sport seasons. Okay. So yeah, we, so it's between, right now it's between winter and spring sports. Okay, you know, so which we thought was kind of neat because you may see some athletes that have never played football or yep. volleyball, yep. you know, play because it's in between sports seasons and they're not doing anything else. Can we do anything for our volleyball players? Yeah. Right now? Yeah. 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 The, 
Yeah, uh, and, and, that, and that is that is part of the recommendation. So yeah. even though their season is postponed to that right. in part, there are opportunities we're looking at providing them for this fall. So, so going back to your second question, if anybody has two million dollars, we'd love to put a turf field. <laughs> I mean, Josh imagine. needs two million dollars <laughs> if you Mr. have Frost it. Mr. Frost is uh, becoming a good fundraiser. Naming, so. we can put it your name. Happen. It could be. It's the Tug White Stadium. We need two million dollars. <laughs> Tug White Stadium. Tug would love to have. Right, turf, but we can put your name on the field. <laughs> just say. Um, Jen, Jen, I'm kind of trying to think of Tug and Turf. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Turf. K and B Auto. Um, <laughs> it's been busy, not that busy. <laughs> uh, so your question was about volleyball, yeah. and yeah, where our plan is to offer outdoor activities. So they're going to again get together the first week, condition, because um, again, a lot of these students have not done a lot since March, and get them into some physical shape. Start working on skills, drills. Um, Mr. Calandra is excited to get them outside. We luck out and we have an open field up on the softball field. So I've already looked into what it would cost for two outdoor nets because we can put two outdoor courts up there. Um, and then put those down and let them, you know, get up there and start, you know, getting ready for what would be their volleyball season in March. And the proposal that we're putting forth, and we'd have to, again, review this on, in October once we've been two or three weeks in, is can we safely allow them to play outdoor matches up there um, have MDI or GSA come over, um, obviously not together, but one at a time, and play, um, play back and forth. Which we would, you know, we'd get referees. It would be, it would be just basically an outdoor volleyball match. But it would be equitable, basically. They'd be getting a lot out of it. I, I believe Mr. Calandro would make it really fun. Yes. Well, I, th I, I would agree. I think our, our coaches would certainly want to make sure that it is is a meaningful and beneficial activity for the kids. You know. They miss it as much as the kids do. Yep. But I think it goes to a larger point, Abby, is you know, the whole intent of this is, you know, is to give kids an opportunity to get out and be physical and to compete and to develop their skills and have the camaraderie and all those things that go along with these activities. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would agree with you. That's, that's the intent of trying to do this. Yeah, and I, you mentioned coaches, and I want to thank our fall coaches because this would have been our fourth week. Um, this, tonight would have been our second football game. Um, you know, and so I, I thank them for... Kind of sticking with me. I've been emailing and contacting them weekly and keeping them updated, and it's been a roller coaster. So, um, you know, they they are ready to go um, as soon as they're given the green light, and they're all they're all excited. So, Josh, what happened with the cheering? They are not spectators. <laughs> um, oh, no, they're not. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> The way that it we was just, worded. Can we just clarify, Josh, that, that's not something that came from the Ellsworth School Department. No, that, no. that came from someplace else. Right. Yeah, so our, our right. conversations along this have included all of our activities. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all I of was our sports. Clear on that and on something that Abby posts. And, mm -hmm. and so the way that came across was wrong. The way it came across was we, we want to offer football. Um, in the original proposal, when they were hoping to offer a full tackle padded football, um, you're looking at teams that may have a roster size of 40 or 50 players. You take a Thornton Academy and a Bonnie Eagle, yeah. and you put them there, you, you're at 100 right there with the two teams combined, not including your referees and everything else. So the gathering size of 100, which is something else that I think you guys should talk mm -hmm. about tonight, mm -hmm. um, is something that the, the MPA looked at and said, how do we, how do we have uh, cheering? And unfortunately, it slipped from one of the executives uh, mouths that you know they count towards our spectators, and that's just where the the slip was. Um, I have a cheerleader at home, the daughter that you know has we've invested a lot of money in cheering. So, um, you know, and so we are in full support of them going forward, and that's why it's it's hard to cheer at a seven v seven football game, um, but it certainly would be great for them to cheer at the soccer games. Um, I can still envision them doing a routine at halftime. Uh, dance routine at halftime just like they would normally for the football games. Yeah. So we wanted to still give them an opportunity to get together, um, have practices. Again, those will all be outside um, as well and, and go forward with that opportunity. Good. Thank you. So. But I think where you in, maybe this is a time to bring it forth, um, a segue, you know, when, when you talk about that unfortunate comment that was made by someone in Augusta, mm -hmm. you know, when you're looking at the uh, gathering limit of 100 that's in the executive order, you know, all of your participants all of your coaches, um, your officials, sideline runners, depending upon the sport, 
count towards that total of 100. So if you look at the scenario that Josh is just talking about, a soccer game where our sideline cheerleaders are there uh, performing and competing, all of your players on both teams count towards that total as participants. Your cheerleaders as participants count towards that total. The coaches of the cheering team, the soccer teams count towards that total. The sideline runners, the officials. Okay. Then you get into the question of how many people is that? So we kind of kick that around today in the typical situation. You know, if you had 20 kids on each soccer team, 18 cheerleaders, several coaches, you know, you're, you're getting close to 60 people right there. Mm -hmm. We're not even talking about spectators yet. Well, and you're not talking the referees, game personnel like myself, clock operator, athletic yeah. trainer. Mm -hmm. I, I would even venture to say you're at between 70 to 75, and that's if you have 20 on a soccer team. You may have, if I can fit 23 on the bus, I'm going with 23. Sure. Um, so. But th then you're trying to get a situation where who was permitted to come and be a spectator? You know, I can tell you there, there's one school that I saw, and I, I would not advocate for this because you know, this is important to our families too, who are saying they're not going to have spectators at all. But by pr having spectators, that's a situation that the administrators are going to have to deal with. How do you determine who comes? Okay. And not only that, is it only home spectators? Do you allow spectators to come from Bucksport, let's say? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of discussion and decisions that have to be made on how that's going to work. And those are some of the details that we're talking about. You know, we're asking you to approve return to sports, but so those are some of the details that these guys are going to have to work out, and those are things that these guys are going to have to enforce. And we, we've lucked out the last several years. We've live streamed. Uh, we started with basketball, yeah. and we moved to football and soccer even last year, live streaming out of the corner of the, um, of the field house at the track. Um, so we, we do have that capability of live streaming our games. Um, I've even thought about moving soccer games over to Tug White Stadium only because to me it's a little bit better venue. You're closer to the action. Um, I have the field, the uh, press box right at the 50 yard line. It's easier for me to stream back and forth. As far as an away team coming in, I pulled them into that side parking lot. Um, porta potties, that's a whole nother issue, but you know, we yeah. have, we have three own. porta potties there. Yeah. We have one for game officials and officials, one for away team, one for home team. Mm -hmm. um, so you pull the bus in, don't, they're don't there. Don't forget spectators. Spectators right now, yes, so possibly a fourth <laughs> porta potty um, But it's just a lot easier to control because you pull the bus in there, right there, all within a hundred yard radius. They're there, they're using the porta potty, their bench is on the, the side of the mm -hmm. uh, press box, so I can control where that away team is coming in and out of this location. Whereas at the track, it's a little different. They tend to park over along the road and cross the track, have to go down over the hill to the porta potty. They're on the far end, so it's just it's a little bit easier. It's easier for me to control um, what's happening. If we have to limit our number sizes, it's a lot easier for me to control that at the at Tug White mm -hmm. than it is obviously at Del Luce. Mm -hmm. You mentioned live streaming. The other thing that we talked about was with the middle school. So um, you know you can't play all your soccer games at uh, Tug White Stadium, but if the middle school is playing at Del Luce, you, know, you have all the same pieces with 100 people. Then you also add in the fact that if, what if somebody's uh, on Forest Avenue in their vehicle with the windows closed? Do they count towards that or not? Um, uh, but we also talked about the live streaming of those soccer games as well, so that if there are parents that couldn't come because of a limitation, there'd be an opportunity for them to see it. So mm -hmm. the live streaming extends to the middle school also. I will say that the athletic director network is very, we, I mean, especially in Hancock County, we're constantly talking um, in, 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 in other counties as well. But it would be a, a lot of communication with the visiting team. Okay, how many, how many team members are you mm -hmm. bringing? You, you have to give me an exact number today on how many you're bringing. Okay, you're bringing you know, 18, that means I have 27 tickets or 27 spectator seats. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so to me, then that's when you, you say, okay, that's one per home team mm -hmm. uh, member. You know, so I don't know if we're looking for a recommendation on that tonight or what, but I will, like Mr. Higgins said, there are schools, multiple schools in the Penobscot Valley Conference that is saying we are not allowing spectators mm -hmm. at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Paul, do you have comments? Or? Yep. I got four here comments and questions. Um, first comment from Casey Hardwick. I feel very, very strongly that Washington and or Penobscot counties be considered by the board for competitive play. Those counties are green. 
And then... Uh, Paul, can I stop for a second? Yeah. If a school... So let's just talk about the county colors, yeah. green, yellow, red. So if you're, if a county, like they just released the new ones today, whereas uh, Hancock County is still green, York is still yellow. You're, if you're a yellow county, you're not practicing, you're not playing, you're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. So if at any point Hancock County became a yellow county, um, then we would shut everything right down until we were back to being mm -hmm. green. So that is something that's in the guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Question from Amy Atherton. <clears throat> what did the guidance mean by visiting teams had to arrive in a, quote, self-sufficient manner, unquote? How is that different than it has been in the past? I, I believe what that means is you come ready to play. Is that is, is that? I think come ready to play, uh, providing their own water. I think I saw something about water vessels. In, I'm thinking the soccer one now. Yep. Not needing um, locker rooms. Not needing locker also. rooms, those types of things. You, know, you, you, you come on the bus, you're ready to play. Yeah, not counting on concessions for. Yeah, that's Well, there, too, there's I'm another sure. piece with concessions that it's. It, 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 I'm sure you read it in there. If you're going to offer them, they've got to be prepackaged and mm -hmm. in a certain way. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it. It's a revenue stream for your boosters, but then, you know, these guys are going to have to figure out how do we make that work. Right. And not selling to very many people. <laughs> right. <really>. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Not cost. Right. Yeah. Uh, next one from Shannon Curtis. If we are talking about risk, the COVID positivity rates in Hancock and Penobscot County are identical at 0.01%, less than Washington County. So 25 miles in either direction, whether you cross a county line, is essentially irrelevant. These kids' families are working in other counties and coming back to Hancock County, where they live with, and send their kids to school here. We will still have travelers through October who are moving amongst us. Our kids are working with them in restaurants and retail locally. Adjacent counties are green and deemed safe. I am having trouble understanding the rationale regarding this recommendation. And then a follow-up question from Amy Atherton. Is there an area defined for the 100 person limit for instance, if the outdoor area is large enough, could you have different locations for spectator stations or sections that would allow for more? Love the live, love the live streaming idea. Thank you. That is interesting, actually. Well, we, we, I'm not sure this goes directly to her question, but you know, if if we're looking at it, you know, if you look at let's say Del Lu Stadium, okay. So what you're talking about is the field and the bleachers, and if you think about where many people attend those games, they're over on the Forest Avenue side. Okay. That area right there is the area for the event. That's 100 people, okay? Now, we did talk about this today. So what if there is a high school soccer game there down below on the middle school fields? Can you still have practice? Is that deemed a separate place? And again, I don't know that the guidance gets that specific. What we talked about was trying to be creative in scheduling and saying, if there's a ball game here, don't schedule practices to make sure. Um, but I, I, I'm trying to interpret um, Amy's question. Um, well, it's interesting it's, because, so we've, in our world, <laughs> it's motorsports. Yep. Yeah. And the guidance for those outdoor events has been interesting. And it, like you said, it's been a little mm -hmm. up for interpretation, I think. But a lot of places are, and I think what she's getting to, are kind of quadranting off. So if you the participants don't count because they're here you know they're they're doing their thing um there's grandstands those grandstands where people can sit um are kind of considered separate so they're actually sectioned off in 50s so no more than 50 people can be in one section they're allowing for 200 because it's outside and it's participants i mean uh, spectators so but when they're doing things like that it's a porta potty for every or a bathroom mm -hmm. for every single section. You're almost yep. segregated yep. to yep. your own section. So I don't know if that's what Amy's getting to, but if you're not, if you have your active participants and they really don't leave an area, then maybe, again, Dan, I don't think it gets specific enough. Really, well, I don't think the, it says the, 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 the way of the way of reading it, and certainly, I, I think what she's what she's driving at is: is it possible to have the opportunity for more fans to be there? Which right. We, we would all like. Um, I, I think it's worth a clarifying question. But when, when when you look at it, 
know, let's take the Tug White Stadium piece. I mean, to me, that's a no-brainer. Um, it's a little more enclosed than Del Luce is. Mm -hmm. 100 people there is 100 people there. That's that's right. your space. You know, so that's the question is, do the bleachers count as a separate place than the field? Right. I think we could ask for clarification. My sense is the clarifying answer is we're going to get, and I, and I don't know this, my sense is you're going to be told that's one it's venue, 100. you've got 100 people, right. is my that's guess. Right, that's what I would think, too. It's, yeah. it's a good question, an interesting question. It's just mm -hmm. strange, the different interpretations. Yeah. You kind of touched on it uh, earlier when you said, what about a car parked on Forest Avenue? Right. Is that, well, you know, that's... It would be the same way at Tug, right? If we didn't block off, yeah. if we didn't block off the, the road that goes by the football Could you field, pull in and park? And could I pull in multiple cars and have them face the field, make sure, make sure their lights are turned off, but, you know, is that something that... They would just not count can't get towards. out of the vehicle, kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I think that's worth the clear. I mean, I, I, I think that's a stretch at, at Tug White. Um, at Del Luce, you know, you're, you're talking about that's you know, Tug White is right on school property. Del Luce, you've got a roadway that's a city road. Right. Does that make it different? So I, I think that's a more pertinent question for Del Luce than it would be mm -hmm. Tug White. But nonetheless, a good question. We'll, we'll, we'll have to seek some guidance on it. But, my sense is it's probably going to be given back to us as your venue is your location. It's 100 total. Mm -hmm. yep. So we talked about soccer and what that looks like. Um, with the volleyball practice, can you just kind of give people at home so they have an idea of just um, what kind of extra cleaning and safety procedures will be going on so they can think for themselves what they want? Yeah, so same, same thing. The balls would be disinfected so many times during practice. Um, you know, we've never done volleyball outside, so even taking volleyballs outside, I would imagine after so many uses with the scuffing of the ground there, we'll have to look at purchasing new ones in the, for the spring anyways. Um, but the ball's clean so many times. Um, I will say that when students, this is for any of those sports, when students are um, in coaches' sessions or uh, coaches talking to them um, or, you know, they're just standing around, um, maybe we're just hitting a ball back and forth, they are going to be asked to wear a mask because um, that's, again, what's in the guidance is, is that. Um, so things of that nature. So you're, And again, with volleyball, you're not, you're, you're six on six, so you're, and you're on different sides of the court, so you're not, um, in, in your, if anything, you're, you're not really crashing into each other mm -hmm. too much. So it's not, right. it's not, it's not like soccer or mm -hmm. George, just, just a clarifying question, and it may relate to what Abby was asking. So in soccer, it's clearly defined in here that roughly every 20 minutes there's a, there's a break for that type of thing to take place. Yep. With the volleyball recommendations that we have in guidance, yep. I, I don't recall seeing that specificity, but I would presume that we would implement something similar for yeah. the students who are playing volleyball yep. in 20 minutes or what have you. Yep. Okay. Yep. So many points, or if we're scrimmaging another team, it would be maybe each um, set, yeah. things of that nature. Yep. So just to reiterate for the people at home, this plan that's been put forward, you're saying that both fall and spring, it's an equitable experience. People are going to get a lot out of this, even if they're just practicing now and then doing their actual season in the spring or if their season is happening in the fall for these other ones it's going to be an equitable experience worth going worth participating in that to the maximum ability they will be noticed as much as they can for scholarship opportunities i mean <laughs> i mean we've never played outdoor volleyball before so i don't know what that you know we, what that I looks like Florida, it's easy it's <laughs> there I, i'm kind of surprised you guys don't do it i, I never even thought that you, a place wouldn't do it until yep. you mentioned it, but no, it's it's easy yeah. peasy lemon squeezy. I promise. Yeah, I mean that's that's hard to that's hard to say. Um, I will say that from my experience in talking to students and with parents that have had their students go to play off in college, a lot of colleges are looking at what they're doing their sophomore and junior years, anyways, um, and they and they were had fall seasons then. Um, so I understand senior year is that last ditch chance. Um, I will say for football and volleyball players, to me, they're getting a bonus. Um, their seasons aren't canceled. We don't know what that's going to look like in the spring. We don't know. Certainly, we're not talking winter sports at all yet. Um, but we're saying they have the opportunity to have that season in the spring. Um, and, and here's something else that you can do right now. It's not like we're canceling it outright and 
and whatnot. So. And by spring, we're not interfering with other sports. We're going to have yep. places for them to play. Yep. So, so those concerns are addressed. So traditionally, if we're talking in a normal year, <laughs> if we can get to yeah. normal at some point, um, after February break, it's really quiet in the gym. Mm. It's uh, our unified basketball season is kind of in full swing during that time, and they're going probably two to three weeks after uh, February vacation. And then for probably two or three weeks after that, that's if the gym is quiet, um, we traditionally will set up the batting cage. But again, I don't know what if they'll delay the spring season by a few weeks to get these other seasons in. So if there's no need to put the batting cage up, obviously we wouldn't do that. Um, and, and also with that being said, it's very easy to take one of the wires down to then play volleyball. So, um, yeah. And maybe just to follow up, Abby, on your question about the experience. You know, I, I know that our coaches are going to work to make sure that in whatever capacity the kids are participating, whether it's the practice sessions, the training sessions, the skill building, or you know, with football and volleyball, if you get to the point where we can play some outdoor competitions for the seven versus seven, they're going to do what they can to make it meaningful and beneficial for the kids. Uh, you know, would, would it, with football, would it be the same as playing the, the eight versus eight tackle game? Um, it would be a little bit different, but, you know, Kids are kids, athletes are competitive. You know, my, my sense is if the kids get an opportunity to play a 7v7 flag opportunity, they're still gonna be competitive, they're still gonna wanna play, and they're still, they're still gonna get a lot out of it. And j just my sense, speaking from my experiences. Um, I have a couple more comments here. Um, one from Kelly Casey. Hi Paul, Ellsworth School Board, we support you to approve a regionalized schedule. You can always play a Hancock County schedule if needed. Uh, Amanda McLaughlin, sports question. Could the board read and become familiar with all the individual sports guidelines and place themselves in the shoes of the people left to implement the, these guidelines before they're asked to vote? It sounds like they're not familiar with the guidelines enough to have an informed vote. Thank you, Josh and Dan, for attempting to summarize some of the guidelines on short notice. Well, actually, I have them printed out. Right. So I was going to clarify, too, with the volleyball and even soccer. Dan had mentioned the ball runners. There was interesting verbiage in here, like if the ball runs out of play, yeah. you know, there's going to be multiple balls there. But volleyball was one of them, um, where if it changes hands, if it, I mean, I can read mm -hmm. it verbatim, but... Um, so in my, in, in my intent with soccer is actually get a whole bunch of disc cones, yeah. line up the side of the field with disc cones, you put the ball on top. So the ball runner is responsible to go chase the ball if it goes across the road, into the woods, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. They go and they grab that ball. We have a cone at every mm -hmm. 15 to 20 yard increment, put the ball down on that cone. And then, so that ball may sit there the whole game and not get used. Mm -hmm. Or it may sit there for 10, 15 minutes and then get used. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like that ball is constantly being And it's clean play. and ready to roll. Like I think, right. I mean, yeah. not that I don't agree that we obviously, but we do have people, Josh is going to be well versed in all of these, and that's, you know, that's his employee, you know, well, and, and so and we I, take that faith. And, yeah. and, and I think, you know, that, that's the piece, you know, the, by being on the two committees that Josh and Dan are on, they, they've seen iterations of, of some of these pieces. So um, no, knowing Josh um, and the way he does his job, he's got plans for a lot of these things already. I, you know, I, I think it's a great question that she's Absolutely. asking. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but, but those are details that, again, I, I have confidence in our staff to put together what they need to do to put these details in place. Again, they're going to be some tough decisions. Um, you know, uh, we'll talk about the 100 people and spectators. That's a challenge. Mm -hmm. But also ball runners. Look, um, we talked about this today. Um, a lot of times, and I was one of these. I can remember being in fourth grade, being a ball runner. Loved it. Um, we have a lot of kids who do that now. Um, we're looking at having kids who may be on the varsity team be a ball runner rather than the younger kids, which would be unfortunate. But, you know, we have to look at those types of pieces too. But these guys are going to have to come up with some very difficult decisions. But I'm, I'm confident that in looking at these pieces, um, should the board approve a return to play, these guys are going to put into place uh, pieces that will work. And you guys have a workshop coming up. Um, mm -hmm. Today is the 11th, right? So... It's not next week, but the week after you've got a workshop. So <laughs> you know, that, that, that could be an opportunity um, to come back and say, these are some pieces that we've got. And even though it's only a workshop, um, it's an opportunity for you to hear, this is what we've got in place for training. This is what we've got in place for making sure we have hand sanitizer. This is what we've got in place for spectators mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. 
Also, in response to that, I wouldn't call it really a question. It is our job as school board members to ask a question, even if we know the answer, yep. because there are p parents out there who need to have these answers so they can make an informed decision for themselves. Yes, we read everything that came through many, many times, but I'm still going to ask these questions for every other person who didn't get that material. And if that's offensive to somebody or somebody is upset because we are asking these questions, I'm not going to apologize for it. I think the questions you guys have asked have been appropriate. Give more. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell by more. A couple more. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't know. Question that. from Chris Popper on outdoor numbers. If they have separate entrances, exits, and bathrooms, you could have 100 in different quadrants. I guess it's not a question, but a statement. <laughs> Uh, and then he had a follow-up on uh, broadcasting of soccer games. He says WDEA will broadcast as many games as possible. Yeah, Chris reached out to me and, and has said that before, and it would be great because then obviously we mic him up, and he does the play-by-play. -play. He's doing it on the radio or uh, on, on WDEA website, and he's doing it on yeah. our live stream. So it's, yeah. and and it's only one person. And it's one person. Games, right. Correct? What's and that? He does that for the game, basketball yes. games, yep. correct? Yep. yep. So yeah. we appreciate that. Comment from... Sean Reed, what is the plan for winter sports? Please start considering them before they arrive so half the season isn't gone before there is a plan. Yes, can we get through the first week of school? <laughs> it's going to. Yeah. Well, but I, 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 think, I think Sean makes a good point, and I'm, I'm, sure that, um, I'm sure that the folks at the MPA, once they get through this piece of getting the fall season started, have already started. You know, the committees that um, Josh and Dan serve on, soccer and uh, football, working there, but there are also committees for all the winter sports, so I'm sure that that's already on their radar, but I do, I do agree with him. Um, you know, it would be nice if there would be more timely information. Uh, you know, here we are, we're looking at a start on Monday, and we're here on a Friday night uh, with the guidance that we just got yesterday. Uh, Shannon Curtis writes, I understand the amount of thought, work, and careful consideration that is involved in making decisions for, quote, the good of the whole, unquote. Trust me when I say I'm with you and not against you. So in asking questions, it isn't to be a pain, but only to understand. Why can we not follow the released guidelines by the MPA and state as written? Meaning, why are we adding the restriction for only county play when there is no documented risks between adjacent counties. I, I think the only, the only response to that is that's the recommendation that's come forth, but the board can recommend that that be changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I know that um, part of that question. And I just want to say it, it, to Shannon again, uh, at least personally, I'm not offended by any question. I'm glad that people no. are asking questions and I think they need to. I, yeah, I don't so think so any of us so, is. So certainly if the response that people are getting is that we don't want to hear them, that's absolutely not true. No, and these are all good questions, Absolutely. and I'm, I'm glad yeah. that people are asking them. And I think yep. this is a good one too. I mean, um, I mean, you know, we've had to, this question has been answered to a certain extent, uh, uh, addressing like logistic considerations mm -hmm. about the distances that some of these other schools outside of Hancock County would um, entail, and and trying to figure out how to get. Uh, you know, the, the JV as well as the varsity team there. And if we have to send them on two different bus runs, it's, it's easier, uh, more, it's more practical to do that if the, if, the, if the games are closer. But, you know, if we, if, if we haven't um, seen a motion yet, but if the motion... Well, Could I just add, yeah. add something that just came into mind? Um, you know, if, if the board is looking at the adjacent county piece, you know, one of the pieces is... Uh, I know in, in years ago, um, a lot of times your varsity teams might travel. So let's just have an example. Your varsity soccer team goes to Machias to play Washington Academy, if Washington Academy is open to doing that. Um, we used to have situations where your JV teams would play. You might play MDI three times, and you might mm -hmm. not go on that longer travel. So mm -hmm. that, may be, that may be a potential solution if the board wants to go to the adjacent county piece. Mm -hmm. Well, and I already know like GSA doesn't have a JV girls basketball, uh, soccer program mm -hmm. so that would be one less opponent mm -hmm. but you know bunky dow at mdi has already said we'll play you five six seven times in jv soccer so mm -hmm. it's you know it's yep. it's easily replaceable um i had a question of my own um concerning uh, pep band we have we thought about that at all or talked about that 
closed, right? Or you want me to? <laughs> I mean, I think I guess the same same thing. You know, it's it's <laughs> it's following that guidance from the DOE. And I know it adds extra. Bands have to be the... 14 feet apart outside, and you've got over 40 in the pet band this year. Wow. Yeah. So I'd that's say you just and, not, and the, the most I don't recent, think that's going to happen. Most, the most recent information on that yeah. is even with the sports guidance that came out, that guidance hasn't changed yet. Right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. that's, that's, right. that's what I heard from the sources right. that I work with, and I believe Mrs. Wright heard the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, as much as I'd love to see them all there, mm. I think if we're thinking in the the sport of competition for you know, and that would take up more of your spots and that would take up too, more spots. Right? Yep. So, yeah. So, yeah. If we had a marching band, I think it'd be a different argument. Because, <laughs> yes. well, you know, it's a different it's scholarship it. opportunity, quite frankly. Yeah, but it's, that's hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. Any other questions from the board? I actually just have one comment. So when we were talking about the regional piece, um, so the city of Ellsworth is actually moving ahead with the community sports guidelines, so for why and the why and you know the travel opportunities, travel um, sports. So I guess obviously in being in very much in support of having the athletics happen, the fall athletics happen, I'd really like to see us be consistent with that. Now I'm not saying it won't turn out that it ends up being that it's Hancock County. Right. Um, be, just because of logistics or other, you know, limitations. Um, but knowing that we're going to have the Y sports, for instance, and travel soccer and all these uh, travel regionally, and those same students attend our schools. So I'd really like to see the recommendation um, or the motion be something more in a line with that so that we're just not limiting ourselves in the initial piece. Can, can, I, can I offer a thought on that? Mm -hmm. if, if what I'm hearing, um, and, and correct me if I'm not hearing it right, um, the plan that's been put forth, if the board is interested in approving that, but wants to amend it so that the sport specific pieces that we've talked about tonight, the Hancock County piece is amended to be consistent with the regional approach, mm -hmm. you could make your motion that way. Is, is, that, what I'm, is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah. Okay. Just, just in case they want to do that. Just in case, because the only thing I'm mm -hmm. thinking is we do have quite a limitation, especially with middle school soccer. Yep. And again, I'm not saying that the logistics may work. You know, Josh has mentioned, you mentioned the transportation issues. But I think if, we're, if we stick with the recommendation that says Hancock County and it's in there and yep. we maybe end up with schools that don't end up participating and then we kind of cut ourselves off from a possible competition with mm -hmm. Cohen and Dowdy and, and all these other schools, Just I'm just talking middle school, but and then at the high school level too, we do have that opportunity if we leave it open. So pr procedurally, what you would do is that, you know, we gave you language for a motion, mm -hmm. uh, but you could include in that motion, um, you know, for example, the was recommend that the board adopt and approve school sports guidance and the entire title as presented um, or as amended to reflect regional competition consistent with the guidelines mm -hmm. contingent upon the ability to implement and enforce the guidance and sports specifics. So right. the, procedurally, the that's how you would do it. And I, I think, Jen, that would go towards what I'm hearing you say is the consistency for the youth sports and the community right. sports guidance. Yep. Yeah. So procedurally, you, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. And, and you're right, that, that would open up the opportunity for that. And you may still find, you know, and again, Josh wasn't sure about Penobscot County, right. but Penobscot I mean, County it, may it, say, we're not, doing we're not it playing too. anybody, right. if that's the right. case. Right. It, you know, and it, I just would hate to see us limit it yeah. and then be in a position where that competition ends up being really nothing. Mm -hmm. And now the kids are really upset mm -hmm. because well, and I we think, had a chance. I think we have to it. make it so it makes sense for Ellsworth High School if we're going to travel to a different County. If we're, if we're going to travel to Penobscot County, I don't think Bangor Christian is a good fit, or Skank, or sure. any of those. Exactly. Like it doesn't make sense to drive. Like now Brewer right. might be Hamden, right. might be you know. So things of that nature. My my biggest fear 
with going too much out of the county is we just saw Penobscot was on that watch list to sure. possibly be yellow. Absolutely. So if they go yellow, we lose four games right there with sure. Hamden and Brewer, let's just sure. say we're playing that. And I agree that those things may pop up. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that this isn't going to be, we're going to set a schedule and this is absolutely going to happen because obviously those things are going to happen throughout the fall and possibly the winter and, you sure. know, it just, I just don't want to see us limited mm -hmm. because I think the kids deserve that chance. So. Are you feeling like we have too high of a chance of for having to forfeit games because of a change with the COVID if we go out of the state? Well, there's no out of the region. Well, yeah, there's no heel points or anything. So as far as forfeiting, it just means that um, if, if we did that, I would then have to contact maybe a Hancock County school and say, hey, can we come play you? Okay. They may say, well, you chose to go play elsewhere, so we don't, I mean, it, I don't imagine it being like that because we're all working together mm -hmm. for obviously our students and, yeah. and opportunities of that nature. So I, I don't foresee that happening, no. Yeah. I, don't, I don't foresee us being shut out of playing games. Local play no. because we yes. chose regional play. No, and, and, and right. you know, the, the principals and the ADs and the superintendents in Hancock County have said, you know, if it's a case where that's, that was your only opportunity, so we play each other three or four times. Right. Okay, it's still a competition. But no, again, the board has the prerogative to make that amendment. Mm. Yeah. And I would just say to add that we just have to see if it's going to work. If Absolutely. Yes. Yep. I'm just saying, you know, if we're if we're considering it tonight, it just would seem like it would make more sense maybe mm -hmm. to offer it at a broader level and then see where the chips fall. You know. I think it's important to note for the middle schools, there already are some Penobscot County schools that are not participating. Mm -hmm. They're doing intramurals, sorry. Right, and but there are some. Yes. There are still some, yes. But I just, I just want to make that like be as transparent as possible about oh, that. Sure. That right. there, even if we regionalize, there may still be schools that we don't play because they're Absolutely. they're not going to participate. Mm -hmm. Or for example, like Newport is in our league, and the travel piece for those for for us to take two teams, we'd oh, have sure. to take two buses. It might right. not logistically work for us. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be transparent about that for the middle mm -hmm. level as well. And I agree. Thank I think, you. You know, I, I think logistics-wise, that kind of could come. But I just, yeah. So, are we ready to make a motion? Um, I, I'm, yeah. Would you like to do it, Jen? <laughs> okay, how are we doing this again? <laughs> okay, okay. okay. If, okay if, if I'm hearing you correctly, what, what the board... So it's, it's in essence, it's to approve the plan, but change the Hancock County to reflect regional. Is, okay. is that in essence what we're talking about? So I have just to make sure I get a little, then we can get the wording the way it should go. Can yeah, I, maybe even not regional, but county or neighboring county. Yeah, because it will adjacent because is North, their wording in the NPA. Yeah, the northern region is all the way up to Aroostook correct, County. Correct, correct. And I, I had asked Dan that question too. Adjacent, yeah. co adjacent, adjacent county. Adjacent. Because that does include everybody, and like you said, Aroostook isn't. Yeah. Right. They're the only two in the PVC that we would head to. Yeah. <clears throat> yep, that's what I meant, Dan. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Adjacent county, I guess. So if, if you were to take the motion that is put here uh, to adopt and approve school sports guidance return to competition for competitive athletics and activities in Maine, as presented by administration and amended to reflect adjacent counties. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm just looking, does everyone understand that to mean that it's yes. this, but we're extending yep. the opportunity to compete in yep. adjacent counties? Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Then I, I think that would be an appropriate okay. procedural okay. motion. I will make a motion to adopt and approve the school sports guidance return to competition for competitive athletics and activities in Maine as presented by the superintendent, EMS, and EHS building administration with an amendment to adjacent counties for competition. Second. Second. Got it. Okay. Rob, second. <laughs> we have done this oh, for did, did, did Abby, did Abby beat you? I think she might have beat me, me to the draw. Second. Okay, so you're conceding to him. Yes. All right, good enough. <laughs> Any discussion? No. All in favor? Excellent. Four to, four to zero. Great. Um, 
one last comment just came in. Um, <laughs> this happened last time too. <laughs> Uh, from Marlena Ford, I find it concerning that pet band participation was so flippantly brushed off, yet spectators were giving a huge importance. S quote, spirit of competition, unquote, of a game includes other people who are students as well, and they also look forward to participation. And for your information, kids in band and chorus and show choir and drama also get scholarships for their participation, frequently, frequently. For example, UMaine gives $250 textbook scholarship for every member of their marching band. Students are, who participate in the arts at UMaine can get $4,000 a year with a teacher recommendation. I think finding safe ways for all of our students to be able to participate is important. And I, think, I think we all agree with that. I, 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 don't, I don't feel like we were flippantly brushing this off. I think that it's, we don't have the guidance yet from the state and we, there's some for... The, the, the guidance that exists. Uh, well, the, the current guidance. Places, yeah. The current guidance yeah. places limitations. I, yeah. think, I think the hard part, and Mrs. Wright spoke of that, if we have the band there, they have to individually be 14 feet apart. They right. can't sit where they normally yeah. sit right. and participate. Right. I don't, and as I said, it would be different, as I said, a marching band because of the scholarship opportunities. We don't yeah. have that. Yeah. I, think, but I think there might be, I mean, I think we should certainly look for further guidance from the state uh, around this. Mm -hmm. and. Um, also opportunities to do PEP um, in different, mm -hmm. different ways, like by having it happen, but maybe not having it happen on the field or... Well, and, and there's no reason you, why we can't live stream our exactly. PEP band um, out in the middle of the football field um, uh -huh. any afternoon, evening, or any time they want to perform. Yeah, but, but I think that's the other thing that's important. You know, you mentioned the guidance, and again, we received some today mm -hmm. on a different topic that change something that we thought before. So mm -hmm. with pet band, something may change, something we don't know. And yeah. But I think we were very clear earlier in the meeting that, you know, I think it was a question from Mrs. Clark earlier, what about our other activities? You know, we're committed to providing, and we talked about this with administrators today, providing the activities and clubs that we have in a safe and responsible manner, regardless of what those are. So you know, I, I think the board seems to share that philosophy. Yeah. And I think too, when Amy asked that question, we don't really have, you know, it says 100. We don't know what that means yet. It could be that there's a way to, to mm -hmm. work that all out. So It does say uh, in number one general guidance, organizers of competitive sports and activities are responsible for limiting the number of individuals that can gather in a shared space in accordance with the governor's executive order on gathering size limits currently set at 50 people indoors and 100 people outdoors or fewer if distancing rules cannot be right. accommodated. It, right, which we... Which we, we can obviously accommodate 100, but... Right. I think the approach just needs to be the same way it has been with the start of school. Try you take it slow and steady, one step at a time. Yep. Right. Do it smartly so that we don't get put into a yellow zone right. and everything right. has to stop. Right. And then we have to wait again until the uh, till the winter. And I, I right. think right. I think everyone involved um, understands where we need to be, and and I trust their their judgment on getting this done. Mm -hmm. I, thank you for saying that, Rob, and, and thank you for the board tonight. I will say with that being said, we are not ready to start Monday. However, uh, I need to get my athletic trainer on campus. I need to obviously get equipment ready. There's forms that all students need to fill out electronically online, which I'll be emailing out either later tonight or tomorrow to all the students. Um, I would like to host a parent meeting, Zoom meeting, because again, it's not just we're jumping into a regular fall season. There's a lot of Mm -hmm. guidelines that need to, to happen so that will happen Monday night mm -hmm. um, I don't have a set time I'm thinking seven but that zoom invite will be sent to all of the students email accounts um, and that will be the way that they can get into the into the meeting I need to get coaches on board and get them ready and get them updated and so there's a lot that has to happen between now and Monday to have a start on Tuesday including getting soccer goals with nets and, and so on and so absolutely forth. so so our our hope is to do the parent meeting Monday um, and start on Tuesday after school, at least at the high school level. Yeah. And Ms. Gabby, I'd like to talk <laughs> about she's ready. potential start date for the middle school <laughs> level, too. <laughs> so we're in a similar boat <laughs> um, where we need to get some things ready, get permission slips to kids. And with the alternating days, it takes just a little bit longer in some cases, yep. but we'll be posting stuff on our website and Facebook pages to update parents about when we're starting and things like that. I know Mr. Wood has, our, has about four emails already written yep. and ready to go. Um, so we will be starting as soon as possible. Um, I think best case scenario is Wednesday of next week um, for tryouts and things like that. 
but again, our, I don't think our students, some of our students haven't been doing things for a while. And so <laughs> we want to make sure that we're also doing it the right way too and getting them conditioned. So we'll be working on that, but we'll have more information forthcoming in the next few days. I think it's important too for parents to remember or community members too that other schools, they had been. So for Ellsworth, this really is the first chance. You know, yep. we haven't had anything, no preseason or anything, and some schools have, so it may appear as if everybody's rolling, but mm -hmm. that's probably right. So. We'll get there. That's right. Mm -hmm. We'll get there. Yep. It might not be the same, but we're going to get there, and there that's will right. be sports for these kids to play. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank uh, all the administrators and uh, the coaches and Josh uh, for working so hard on this, mm -hmm. and Dan as well. Um, uh, I know it's, it's been an, an extraordinary amount of extra work that, because yeah. it's always a lot of work. Uh, I'd also like to thank the community, the, the parents and others who have um, reached out to us with, um, with thoughtful comments and questions. And um, I know everyone is very um, eager to have some form of these activities take place and even if it can't be the way it always is um to get to get the kids back to let them play as the hashtag goes and mm -hmm. as the father of uh two sons my older son graduated from ellsworth high school over a year ago he he was in pep band he was in jazz band he was in um all those things he he, he did uh, i mean he did several sports and he even had a small role in a in a play at one time <laughs> And, <laughs> and my younger son is in eighth grade, and she's, he's champing at the bit to go into cross country and then the, what follows that and, and also the, the drama and the music and all that. So I know that um, many, every, every parent of children. We're going on to fairy hours. <laughs> so I want to thank, I want to thank to the community members <laughs> and families who have reached out to us and, and helped us inform our decision well, making on this transportation questions but and i want to thank donnie also <laughs> his presence tonight was missed um until now and we're glad we got to hear him All right. and so with that um we're on to Motion item k calendar and announcements we have a workshop on the 22nd and then again on the 29th both of those will be right here in chambers mm -hmm. And your next uh, regular board meeting is October 13th. Perfect. All right. Um, item L, adjournment. We have a motion. I make a motion to adjourn. What? Is there a second? So Donnie, Donnie, Donnie can't make a motion. Abby, <laughs> Abby seconded it. And Erica needs to get home to watch a game. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor? All right, the motion passes, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you guys for being here and answering all the questions. <laughs>